Hey team, Sid here from DevOps Directive, and I want to welcome you to my complete Terraform course. This course is for anyone looking to level up their DevOps skills and add Terraform as a tool in their tool belt. This course assumes some familiarity with basic programming constructs, as well as with Amazon Web Services, the cloud provider used for the examples, but everything else will be covered. In the next two and a half hours, I'm going to go through a progression from the very basics all the way to a modular automated infrastructure as code configuration, deploying to both a staging and a production environment using Terraform. I alternate between theory and hands-on examples to give a solid foundation, while also showing how the principles can be applied in the real world. If at any point during the course you have questions, feel free to ask them in the comment section below, or I've added a dedicated channel on the DevOps Directive Discord, where myself or other members of the community will help. Without further ado, let's get into it. So what is Terraform? In HashiCorp's words, and that's the company behind Terraform, it is a tool for building, changing, and versioning infrastructure safely and efficiently. It falls into this category of infrastructure as code tools, which allow you to define your entire cloud infrastructure as a set of config files, which then the tool Terraform can go off and interact with the cloud provider API and provision and manage on our behalf. This course is structured into a number of different modules and so right now I'm just gonna go through kind of the high level overview of what each of those modules contains. The first section is just kind of about the evolution of cloud infrastructure in general and where infrastructure as code fits into that. The second and third modules are about Terraform, giving an overview of the tool itself, how to get set up. The third one gives us a very basic idea of how to use Terraform with AWS. In modules four and five, we start to get a little bit more advanced, taking advantage of variables and outputs within HashiCorp configuration language, the language that Terraform uses, as well as explore some of the other language features that enable us to make this a very powerful tool for managing cloud infrastructure. In modules six and seven, we take a look at how you should be organizing your Terraform projects, uh, including building reusable modules to make your code much more extensible and applicable to various environments, and then in module seven, we take a look at how we can manage multiple environments like a staging environment, a development environment, and a production environment using this tool. Finally, in module eight and nine, we start to look at how you can test your infrastructure as code configurations and what various developer workflows might look like, including automating deployment with something like GitHub Actions. Now, throughout the course, I'll be using this reference architecture diagrammed here on the right to show what you can do with something like Terraform. In this case, it's a basic web application taking advantage of a number of Amazon Web Services products, including multiple instances running on EC2, using an elastic load balancer for incoming traffic, an RDS database instance, storage within S3, and then Amazon Route 53 for DNS. I'm using the, and I'm using the default VPC for simplicity. Now, keeping all of this within AWS was just a choice made for simplicity of the examples. It is not a limitation of Terraform. In fact, Terraform can interact with pretty much anything in the cloud with an API. I've also built out this reference architecture and all the examples that you'll be seeing throughout the course into this companion GitHub repo. So it's under my GitHub username, Sid Palace, DevOps Directive Terraform course. You can see the, the folder structure here is organized uh, along with the modules that I just built. And so with each module, we'll have some examples. I'll show what those examples look like and go through them in the, the video. But if you want to follow along and or use these in your own learnings, you're welcome to take this repo, fork it, modify it in any way, and use it as you learn and deploy your infrastructure with Terraform. With that overview out of the way, let's go ahead and move into part one of the course. If we think about what tech companies who are building applications that were deployed to the web needed to do in the early 90s and 2000s, here's what it looked like. You would come up with your idea. You would then need to write the software for your application. And then you need to go off and buy a whole bunch of servers and set up a, a, a data center somewhere, handle all of the power management and networking and operational overhead that comes with running your own data center. And this was a very challenging process. Uh, it meant that it was much harder to get started. If I wanted to host something, there weren't companies out there like AWS, like Google Cloud, to do so at the click of a button. Instead, we often needed to buy 
uh, capital expenses like big servers uh, and deal with all that ourselves. This shifted quite a bit in the 2010s. So now, again, you have your idea. You program it up on a, a much more modern personal computer here. Uh, and then rather than provision your own servers, you deploy to the cloud. It's become pretty much the de facto standard. You can obviously still buy your own servers and, and host them yourselves, but most companies when getting started would rather have a on-demand resource that they can pay uh, a, a cloud provider to spin up and spin down servers versus having to deal with uh, managing all that themselves. So it's a very different world than it was uh, back in the 90s and, and 2000s. The, the major differences is that infrastructure is now provisioned via API, so application programming interfaces. This is the interface that someone like AWS provides us where I can go in, uh, issue a call to their system and say, hey, I need five more servers. And within a couple minutes, those servers will be online. The speed at which those servers can be brought up and down is a game changer in terms of how we think about those things. If I'm buying a server, that thing, in order for me to get my money's worth out of it, it needs to be running operational for many years before I'm going to be able to pay off that, uh, that cost. Now, if I know that I have a big demand coming, I can scale up, I can triple the size of my infrastructure in a few minutes. Uh, and then let's say it was Black Friday and that sale is over and the traffic has, has gone down. I can destroy those just as quickly. We used to think about infrastructure as long lived and mutable. By that, by mutable, I mean it can change. So I would spin this up, I would install my operating system, I would install all the dependencies. That server would be managed over time. I'd have system administrators who were keeping, making sure that they were patched and up to date. Some of that starts to be offloaded, that responsibility is offloaded onto the cloud. And now we think about cloud infrastructure as short-lived and immutable. So rather than having a server that's up for years on end and is, is being modified and different dependencies are installed and changed and patched, now we, if we need to change a dependency, oftentimes we'll just provision a brand new server with those dependencies already installed and tear down the old one. And so each individual unit is this short-lived immutable thing that we're never going to change. And that's, a, that's kind of a paradigm shift in how we think about uh, infrastructure for web applications. Now, there's three main approaches for provisioning cloud resources. Uh, the first of which is kind of what most people, when they're first getting started with cloud, you'll go and you'll log into your cloud provider and they give you this nice graphical user interface, the, the cloud console. And just by clicking around, you can, you can interact with all of their services this way. The second method is via an API or a command line interface. So all of the major cloud providers give you access via a command line interface. For AWS, it's called AWS, and you can type out AWS uh, EC2 new instance, et cetera, and it will, it will do the same thing uh, as clicking in the interface, but it's a little bit more easy to interact with programmatically, uh, so that is important. And then the third approach is infrastructure as code. Uh, and so that's the one that we're really focused on within this course, and it enables you to take your entire infrastructure and define it within your code base, this is really good for a few reasons. One, you know exactly what is provisioned at any given time. It's very easy for someone to go into the GUI and, and provision something. You set all these options as you're going, but then it's very hard to reason about what exactly the state of uh, what your current infrastructure is. And let's say you're provisioning multiple environments, a staging environment and a production environment. You don't have any guarantees that those are the same. And so by defining things as code, as configurations within your code base, you can have much higher confidence about what you actually have deployed and use the power of programming languages to have multiple copies of the same thing and, and be confident that they're deployed uh, identically. And so what actually is infrastructure as code? I'm taking a, a definition that I really liked out of a book called Terraform Up and Running by Yegveni Brinkman. Uh, it's a great book that you should take a look at. But there's a number of different categories of infrastructure as code tools. The first of which is just an ad hoc script. So maybe you're writing a shell script that makes some calls to Amazon and says, provision me five EC2 instances. Um, and that's kind of the, the baseline of like, is that really infrastructure as code? I'd say it's kind of borderline. Uh, but it does allow you to have something in your code base that is telling you what infrastructure to provision. 
Uh, the second category of infrastructure as code tools is configuration management tools. And so this is things like Ansible um, or Puppet or Chef where you are, they are really positioned to manage uh, the software that is running and the configuration of infrastructure. And so these are more well-suited for on-prem setups where you're provisioning some hardware and then you need to manage how the, uh, you need to manage what software is installed and how those are configured. Uh, the third category is server templating tools. And so this is, this, this category is for building out a template for what you're going to provision onto a server. So if you've heard of an AMI, an Amazon machine image, uh, or the basically any virtual machine image is provisioned from uh, some template and you can build in all your dependencies into that template. And so that's the third category of how you can actually build that template. So you can spawn multiple copies of the same server over and over. The fourth category is orchestration tools. Uh, the most popular these days uh, in terms of orchestration tools is Kubernetes, uh, which is for orchestrating containers. There's a number of other orchestration tools out there as well, but these are for how you can define your application deployment, less, less in terms of defining the, the servers behind it, but how you can take your code and deploy that in a certain way onto whatever uh, system you have provisioned in the background. And then the fifth one, uh, is the provisioning tools. And as the name might suggest, that's focused on provisioning those cloud resources to begin with. And an important thing to call out here is the concept of uh, declarative versus imperative. And so what I mean by that is declarative tools, you define the end state of what you want. Uh, I want uh, five servers, I want one load balancer, I want an S3 bucket, etc. And then the tool manages what API calls need to be made and how to actually make that happen. Imperative, on the other hand, is you tell the system what you want to happen and the sequence in which you want them to happen. And so some of these tools, a lot of the configuration management tools for, fall more on the imperative side. Uh, they do offer some utilities to make them more declarative and, and make those scripts uh, item potent so you can run them multiple times. Uh, but a lot of the provisioning tools, which of which Terraform falls into, they are primarily on the declarative side. So you specify the end state that you want your infrastructure to take, and then you let the tool handle the details of how to actually get there. And so with that breakdown of these different types of infrastructure as code tools, let's actually take a look at kind of the landscape of what software exists that falls into these categories and how they, uh, how they actually work. The first way to look at the landscape is in terms of cloud specific versus cloud agnostic. So on the left hand side, cloud specific is things like cloud formation, things like Azure Resource Manager uh, or Google Cloud Deployment Manager. These are all tools provided by a major cloud provider and they are focused on provisioning infrastructure within that cloud. So cloud formation is an AWS specific tool. If you need to provision something within AWS, it's great. If you need to provision anything outside of AWS, you're kind of out of luck. Same thing for these other tools. They're really focused on provisioning infrastructure within a specific cloud. On the cloud agnostic side, these are tools which can be used across any cloud provider. So things like Terraform, things like Pulumi, uh, there's a number of other uh, tools as well. They can be they can interact with almost anything with an API online. And so if you have your application deployed across multiple clouds, or you want to be able to use auxiliary services, maybe you're uh, using Cloudflare or you're using uh, Atlas for MongoDB or some other third party uh, hosting service that's outside of your primary cloud. Having a cloud agnostic approach is a really powerful thing. And so that's just something to think about as you're looking at infrastructure as code for your project. Are you planning to have everything within one cloud or may it span across multiple clouds? And so Terraform, having that cloud agnostic approach is really powerful if you might have resources outside of your primary cloud. So let's move on to part two of the course. And this is kind of an overview of Terraform itself and how to get set up and authorized with AWS. The process of authorizing Terraform to work with each individual cloud provider or any tool is quite similar. And so we'll go through that process and what it looks like for AWS. And there's documentation online you can follow for, for any of the other systems that you might need to, to interact with.
Okay, I talked about this a little bit in the intro, and again, here's that definition from HashiCorp. Terraform is a tool for building, changing, and versioning infrastructure safely and easily. And so why would we want a tool that can do these things? The reason is that it enables us to take all of the learnings and the best practices that have been developed for software development uh, and apply them to infrastructure. So if we, we want to be able to use version control to understand the changes from one, uh, one day to the next, we want to be able to have code, real code reviews uh, on software so that we can ensure quality is high and bugs don't slip through. Infrastructure as code allows us to take those practices and things like them and apply them to infrastructure development. Uh, the other thing that's great about Terraform is that it is cloud agnostic and is compatible with many clouds and services and can interact with pretty much anything with an API. And so uh, in this diagram here at the bottom, we're taking our configuration files that live in our version control system. We pass them through Terraform and we get out a, a set of servers and network and config provisioned in the cloud provider that we can then go off and use. In the previous module, I talked a little bit about uh, the differences between Terraform and Ansible and the different categories of infrastructure as code tools. And there's many common patterns for using Terraform with some of those other types of tools. So Terraform is a, a provisioning focused tool. We might use it with a configuration management tool. So let's say we have our setup and, and Terraform is going to provision uh, a number of virtual machines for us. We could then take a tool like Ansible and install all the necessary dependencies inside of those virtual machines. So let's say we're using some standard base image like the uh, that is provided by Amazon itself. We then might need to take that base image, which is running Ubuntu or some other operating system, and install all the necessary dependencies for our application. We could manage that piece of it with, uh, with Ansible. So that's one pattern that some companies use. We also can use Terraform with uh, templating tools. So uh, environment templating tools, this is the logo for a, a tool called Packer, which is also from HashiCorp. And in this case, uh, Terraform provisions the servers and Packer is used to build the image from which those virtual machines are created. So rather than provisioning and then installing and configuring like we were with Ansible, now we can pre-package all of that into a machine image that we can provision copies of with, with Terraform. So templating tools and provisioning tools pair really nicely together if, if that's what we want to go with. And we can actually even build our application code into that server template so that once it's provisioned, not only does it have all the dependencies, it also has our application bundled right in. Now, a third pattern that I really like is combining a provisioning tool like Terraform with an orchestration tool like Kubernetes. So in this case, we're using Terraform to provision our Kubernetes clusters. Maybe it's a managed cluster like an Elastic Kubernetes service, EKS cluster within AWS. Maybe it's a self-managed cluster where we're provisioning a bunch of virtual machines and installing Kubernetes onto it. But we're using Terraform to define the cloud resources. And then we're using Kubernetes to define how our application is deployed and managed on those cloud resources. So I think that's another common pattern that is very powerful uh, to use uh, when thinking about infrastructure as code. Now, before we actually go and, and set Terraform up, I want to talk a little bit about how the project is architected. So at the very center of Terraform, we have what's called Terraform Core. And this is kind of the engine that takes our configuration files, so that Terraform config there on the bottom, in conjunction with our current state of the world, so the Terraform state file, uh, which Terraform manages, and it, it basically contains references to all the, arc, all the infrastructure that we've already provisioned. So it can take those two inputs, and then it needs to figure out how to interact with the cloud provider APIs to make that state match the config that we want it to. And so what happens here is we actually have broken out what they call providers. And so these providers are, are kind of like plugins to the core that tell Terraform how to map a specific configuration, let's say for AWS, onto the current state of AWS's API. Or if we're, we're provisioning something in Cloudflare, we need to take that configuration and map it onto the specific set of API calls to achieve the desired state. And so there's many different providers that are available. You'll find that pretty much any major uh, internet service that you would want to use will, will likely have a provider. There's, I think there's over, uh, at least over 100, uh, maybe even more. And so you'll be able to find good coverage of the types of resources that you want to provision uh, and use those 
you install them alongside Terraform Core so that you're able to authenticate and then make all these uh, necessary requests to the, the proper API. And so that just gives a, a high level overview of kind of how the Terraform system and ecosystem is set up. Let's go ahead and get this installed on your system. Okay, so for this first demo portion, I'm just gonna go through a few quick steps of getting started with Terraform. Basically what I just described in that last module, I'm gonna show you how to install Terraform, authenticate with the AWS provider, uh, kind of do a hello world config, and then I'll actually go and provision a virtual machine on AWS using that configuration. So to install Terraform, I'm using a, a system with Mac OS, and so I'll do just brew install uh, Terraform, and that'll go off and download it from uh, the package manager. Uh, we also, there's a number of other ways you can install. If you just Google for install Terraform, it'll take you to the HashiCorp uh, documentation. Uh, they've got a few different options here. One, you can just download the binary, the pre-compiled binary uh, from GitHub. Uh, you can use Homebrew. If you're on Windows, you can use Chocolatey. So I just suggest going to this page uh, and installing with the, the method of your choosing. So here we see it's already installed. Uh, we've got the latest version, 1.1.5, uh, and that should be good. Uh, the next thing is authenticating to AWS. And so for AWS, uh, I have created a, uh, a user. So if I go to IAM here, I've created a specific user uh, for this course and given it the exact set of uh, IAM roles that are needed to perform the different actions that I'll be doing throughout the course. Uh, if I go here to the user groups, I've got this Terraform course group. Uh, within this, we can see that this Terraform course group has uh, RDS access, because we're going to provision a database later on. EC2 access, we'll be provisioning virtual machines in EC2. Uh, the ability to manage IAM roles, because we'll also be using Terraform to set up some IAM policies. Uh, we'll be creating S3 buckets and Dynam DynamoDB tables, as well as some Route 53 rules. So this is the set of permissions that are required uh, for the configurations that are within the GitHub repo. So if you want to duplicate this within your own account, that could be useful. Uh, and then uh, I have installed the AWS command line. So I have the command line installed here. If you need to install that, uh, I would just Google for AWS CLI. And then uh, over here on the right, it has instructions on how to install for various operating systems. Uh, once you get that installed, you'll want to run a, the AWS configure command, and that will allow us to pass in uh, three things. One, an access key ID. And so this is going to correspond to the service account that we are using and that Terraform is going to use to actually provision this stuff. So if we go under users and we choose this Terraform user under secu security credentials, and then I'll create a new access key. And so this access key ID we'll use. We also want the secret key. And don't worry, I'm going to delete this key as soon as I finish recording. And then uh, a default region to use. And US East 1 is fine, so I'm just not going to put anything. Uh, we'll leave the output format as JSON. And so now that has populated a file in my home directory, uh, slash dot AWS, uh, this credentials file. And so inside that credentials file, I now have the secret keys and Terraform if we don't do if we don't do anything else, we'll use that we'll use those credentials to authenticate on our behalf. Uh, at this point, we have Terraform installed and we are authenticated to AWS. And here is essentially the basic the most basic uh, Terraform configuration that we can have. Uh, in this top block, we specify which providers we're going to use. And so I'm using the AWS provider specified at version 3.0. Uh, within here, I'm defining a default region uh, for that provider. And then this is uh, corresponding to an instance within EC2. Uh, I'm naming it example. Uh, we're providing a, uh, an operating system. So this particular uh, string corresponds to Ubuntu 20.04 in the US East region. So that's telling it when we provision this VM, we wanna be running that Ubuntu uh, operating system. And then we're gonna use the T2 micro instance type. 
There's a whole bunch of other options that we can use, uh, and I can show you how to find those within the Terraform documentation. So here under the AWS provider, we can see this resource AWS instance and the types of fields that are allowed. Uh, so we can specify an, AW, an AMI like we did. Uh, you can tell it which availability zone. You can tell it uh, how many CPU cores. There's all of these options. Most of them are optional. Uh, and so I'm just giving it the very minimal amount of config so that we can see how this process works. Now, if I navigate into that directory, so we're within the uh, O2 overview directory, uh, I can do Terraform in it. And that will initialize the backend. Because I didn't specify anything else, it's going to store this, this backend in state locally. We'll hear more about that in future modules. But this is the first step to using Terraform. You initialize within the directory where your uh, code is stored. Now let's run the Terraform plan command. That's going to go off and query the AWS API and compare, hey, what is currently deployed? And how does that compare to the, the resources that we've specified in our main.tf there? And it's showing us that that example instance does not exist. And so if we run apply, it will be created with all of these attributes. Uh, these are going to be known after apply because we didn't specify them. So it's going to figure that out um, once we actually do the apply. And so this is looking good. And I'll go ahead and run Terraform apply. And that's going to go and take the actions that we saw in the plan and go off and provision that. It prompts me if I, if I do indeed want to uh, proceed. I do. And so this can take a little while while that instance provisions in the background. I can go into the AWS interface and actually see it happening. So if I go back to here and now go to EC2, we should see we're in the correct region, Northern Virginia, and we see this instance pending. So this is being provisioned uh, as we speak. We can pull this over here. We see it's creating. Apply complete, resources added. If I go back to the AWS page, we can see that it's now running. And so that Terraform apply was successful. I was able to create the instance. Uh, and that's essentially the most basic configuration that you can use. We'll be building upon this in future modules, but I just wanted to show the getting started process, installing, authenticating, and provisioning something with Terraform. Now I'll do the final step here to clean up the resources so we don't end up leaving them running and having to pay for them. And that's the Terraform destroy command. It's going to ask me whether or not I would like to actually do that. I do. And it's going to go off and destroy that instance in the background. We see it shutting down here on the right hand side. And that should be all we need to do. At this point, let's jump back in and learn a little bit more about Terraform and some of the other features as we start to build out our infrastructure using it. Now that you've seen that hello world example walked through, let's take a look at some, some more basic Terraform usage. As we saw, the sequence for interacting with Terraform configurations is generally these four primary commands. There's the init command, which initializes your project, the plan command, which takes your configuration, checks it against the currently deployed state of the world and your state file, and figures out the set of the sequence of things that need to happen to provision that infrastructure. The terraform apply command takes that set of commands and applies them so that you end up with the infrastructure you want. And then the final one, if you're cleaning up resources after doing an example like this, or if you are just, if you are taking down infrastructure that was being used previously, but is no longer needed is the terraform destroy command. So this is kind of the, the general sequence of things that you'll see happen over and over and over again, as you're working with terraform. As a reminder, the architecture looks like this with the core providing that, uh, engine for parsing your configuration in the state files and the providers mapping uh, what's needed from the core to your cloud providers themselves. And there's many, many different providers. Uh, if you go to the registry.terraform.io, 
you can find a list of existing providers. You can also, because it's open source, you can actually program your own providers for any other resources that you would need to provision. Here, I've actually zoomed in on just the AWS specific provider. So if we were to click on that orange button, we would see this specific uh, provider from AWS. You can see it has that official tag. So it's the official AWS provider. Uh, if it doesn't have the official tag, it may just be some third party individual or organization that's managing that. So the official tags give us a higher level of confidence and trust in this provider being up to date and high quality. Uh, and then there's many modules associated with that provider down below. Finally, the way that we use providers in our code, we saw this in the Hello World example, is you specify within that first Terraform block the required providers, and you can pin the version so that you have a specific version of that provider. And then each provider may have some set of configuration that is required, for example, specifying the region uh, for the AWS provider. I'm going to go through a little more in detail each of those commands that we've already seen, but actually explain what all they're doing. Uh, so the terraform init command, uh, and on the right hand side, I've run the, the tree command, which is going to show us the set of files in our uh, directory. And that will help us understand the sequence of events that happen when we init. Uh, so we've got our working directory here. There's nothing in it. Uh, only our main.terraform file containing that hello world example uh, is in it. So we see that here on the right. When we run the init command, that actually goes off and downloads the associated providers that we defined in that Terraform block. So it's going to get the code for the AWS provider from the Terraform registry. It actually downloads that and puts it into our working directory. So if we run the tree command again, we see, oh, now we have a .terraform hidden directory with a provider subdirectory, a registry.terraform.io directory. And what that's showing is that's the official registry, but you can have additional uh, custom Terraform registries or, or third-party registries where those providers are actually stored. And then we go all the way down and we see that final uh, directory. We're seeing the version, uh, the architecture, and then the actual code for that uh, provider lives in that final sub uh, subdirectory. We also now have a lock file. And that lock file contains information about the specific dependencies and providers that are installed within this workspace. The next thing that it does uh, is if you have used any modules, and we'll talk a little bit more about what modules are in the future, but they're essentially a way to bundle up uh, Terraform code so that it's reusable. If you're using any of those, it would go and download that as well and pull those into our working directory. And so the where those get slotted into our, into our file system is also within that Terraform subdirectory. We have the providers, and then as a sibling, we have this module subdirectory. And so that would go off and download and store all of the Terraform configurations associated with those modules. And now another important concept about Terraform that we need to know is the state file. And the state file is Terraform's representation of the world. So it is a JSON file, uses the JSON file format, and it contains information about every single resource and or data object that we have deployed using Terraform. So resources, resources can be anything in the cloud provider itself. As you can see here on the right, this is uh, the portion of a state file referencing a specific Amazon instance that we have provisioned. Uh, it's got lots of metadata about that instance, such as the IP address or the, or the ARN, the, the unique ID for that uh, resource within AWS. There's many more attributes that I've pulled out just to save space, but you could imagine this having all the information about all the resources we've deployed. There's also the concept of a data object. So within Terraform, there are blocks which correspond to resources. There's also blocks which correspond to data. And those, maybe we're pulling some information from a third-party API, or we could have some fixed data within our code. And those can be used to reference things that, that were not provisioned and are not managed by Terraform, but we want to pull those in uh, to influence how the infrastructure is actually provisioned. Now, finally, the state file will contain sensitive info. So if we're creating a password on the fly for a database that we're provisioning, that password will be stored within the state file. So you need to protect the state file accordingly, make sure that it's encrypted and the permissions are set so that only the correct uh, set of individuals would have access to it. So that's just something important to, to note about the state file. You can also store the state file locally or remotely. When you first install Terraform, I believe the default is for it to be stored locally. So it'll be within the, the working directory of our project. We also, and this is how Terraform is generally used in uh, 
within a company where you have multiple people working on it, you can store that state file remotely, uh, usually in uh, an object store like a S3 bucket or Google Cloud Storage. And we'll, we'll talk about what that means and how to set things up uh, accordingly. So the first option is a local backend. So this is the simplest option to get started. Uh, we've got you, the individual, we've got our laptop or, or desktop computer, and we've got our Terraform state file. And this is great because it's super easy to get started. Uh, it just sort of works out of the box. It'll store the state file right alongside our code. It's not so good for a number of reasons though. One, it will have our sensitive values in plain text within that JSON file, like I was just describing. So that's not great to have things like that on your local system. It just provides a potential attack target. It also is uncollaborative. So there's no way for me to take a state file living on my laptop and have someone else work on it in an easy fashion. So that makes it very challenging to work with other engineers uh, on your infrastructure configuration. And three, it's very manual. So every time I'm interacting with the uh, configuration and applying it, I generally need to run a Terraform plan or a Terraform apply command within my command, uh, within my terminal. And that is not how we want to be doing this ideally. Ideally, we want to automate a lot of this. And so if we think about what a remote backend enables, we can separate the individual developer on the left-hand side from the state file, which is now stored in a remote server somewhere. One option is Terraform has a managed offering called Terraform Cloud that will host uh, our state files for us and manage things like permissions, et cetera. We can also self-manage a remote backend to store those state files uh, using something like Amazon S3, Google Cloud Storage. There's, there's a number of different remote backends that we can configure. This is great because it allows us to encrypt all the sensitive data that would be within that file and gets it off of our, our local system. So that's a, a big win. Uh, it is also good because now we can have multiple people that are all interacting with this same remote backend. So it makes collaboration with other engineers much easier. It uh, allows us to automate things. So now because we are no longer dependent on running those Terraform commands locally on our system, we can run things like GitHub Actions or other uh, automation pipelines that can interact with this remote uh, state as well. The one downside is that it does add increased complexity compared to the, the local backend. So if you're just an individual getting started with Terraform, it's easier to get started with the local backend, but all these benefits generally outweigh uh, the con of the, the slight increase in complexity there. Let's move on to the next the next command within the, the general sequence, and that's the Terraform plan command. And so what it is doing, it is taking our Terraform config, which we're, we're mapping, which we're defining on our system, uh, that is the desired state. So what we want our, our infrastructure to look like, and then it compares it with the Terraform state, which is the actual state of the world. Uh, and it, that's a slight misnomer because you could have gone in and modified something within the GUI or, or sort of out of band of our Terraform workflow. As long as you haven't done that, the Terraform state should represent the actual state of the world. If you have done that, you can actually get yourself into trouble. So you should you should always try to keep, you should try to avoid making modifications to your infrastructure outside of the Terraform uh, workflow. That being said, we compare the desired state with the actual state. So let's say in our Terraform configuration, on the left-hand side, we've got a network configuration, we've got four servers that we want to provision, and we've got a database. But previously, we've already deployed this, and we've got our network configuration, three servers, and a database. So when we run that plan command, it's going to go through our config and say, OK, the network config looks identical, great. Uh, the database looks identical, great. However, we've got a mismatch in the number of servers that we want provision. We're scaling up. We told it. We want four, but there's only three currently deployed. And so the plan command is going to bring that in and say, I need to add one virtual machine here. That plan can then be fed into the AWS provider, and it can figure out the sequence of API calls that are necessary to actually provision that VM. Now, if we go and run the Terraform apply command, it's going to go off and do that. So we, plan we hit the apply command, and it will create that new resource within AWS. And then great, we have our configuration, our desired state matching our deployed actual state. And that's what we wanted. Now, finally, the destroy command. So let's say this was just an example and I'm cleaning up and I want to, to get rid of all these resources. 
Now, what that does is I issue the command and it will go off and destroy everything within that configuration as associated to this particular project. And so this command you only want to run when you want to clean up at the end of a project. Uh, you do never you never want to run this uh, for a live project that you actually are still executing on. So just a warning, that's what happens. I talked earlier about local backends versus remote backends. And so right now I want to give an overview of the two primary options for dealing with remote backends. The first of which is Terraform Cloud. So this is a managed uh, offering from, Terra, from HashiCorp itself. And so to use the Terraform backend, within that initial Terraform block, you would specify a backend field of type remote. And then you, within the web application for, for Terraform Cloud, you would have created a organization and a workspace name. And so we can specify those two attributes here. And this is kind of what it looks like on the web UI. You can go in, you have your account, you've created your organization and your workspace. And when you deploy to that, you can see it here and interact with it. And so this is a, this is a, a very easy way to get started uh, and it can be great. It is free up to five users within an organization. However, if you need more than five users, so as your company grows, it does start to cost $20 per user per month. So as the number of developers increases, it can be expensive to uh, pay for this. And so, while Terraform itself is free to use, this is how HashiCorp actually makes money from this product, is through this managed offering. The other option for remote backend is a self-managed backend. And so AWS has one option. There's also a, a GCP and an Azure option here. Uh, but for the AWS option, you're specifying an S3 bucket as well as a DynamoDB table. And so the S3 bucket is where the state file will actually live. And we can tell it whether we want it to be encrypted or not. Generally, you want that to be true. But for the DynamoDB table, the important thing there is that because we could have multiple people working on the same project at once, you want to prevent two people from trying to apply different changes at the same time. So we use that uh, the atomic guarantees that the DynamoDB offers to, if I issue a, a command, I can lock the Terraform configuration such that if someone else, one of my colleagues issues another uh, Terraform apply command, they will get a, reject, that apply command would be rejected until mine has finished. And so this just prevents us from getting into a weird state where two things are being applied at once and that could cause issues. However, you might be thinking, Sid, how are you going to provision these S3 bucket and DynamoDB, bu and DynamoDB tables given that we want to provision everything with infrastructure's code, but we don't have these resources provisioned yet? So it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. And so there is what, uh, I'll refer to as a bootstrapping process that will enable us to provision those resources and then import them into our configuration so that even the remote backend resources can be managed by Terraform as well. And so the way that we do that is first, we specify our Terraform configuration with no remote backend. So it will default to a local backend. We then define the resources that we need, that S3 bucket and that DynamoDB table. It's important here that the hash key is lock ID. So that, that's a key attribute that needs to match this exactly in order for this to work. We then would go through our normal uh, apply process. So we would run Terraform apply. It would tell us here's what's gonna be created, a DynamoDB table and an S3 bucket. We say yes, it goes off and applies those. So now within our Terraform state file, we have those two resources. Within our AWS account, we also have those resources provisioned. We can then change our backend. So we, before we didn't specify a backend, now we're specifying we want to use the remote uh, backend, the S3 configured remote backend with the proper uh, configuration applied. This is all the, the configuration that we had before that's unchanged. And now if we go and rerun our Terraform init command, it will recognize, oh, before you were using a local backend, now you have a remote backend. Do you want to import that state into the new backend? This is where we'll say yes. It'll go off, upload that state file into the S3 bucket. And now we have our state in that remote backend, including the bucket, the S3 bucket and DynamoDB table that we're using as the, the resources that are backing that. So it's kind of a tricky thing with that bootstrapping process, but that's how we can go from having nothing to having our the infrastructure needed for the remote backend 
into our Terraform config. You can see our state files within that bucket itself. Uh, they will be encrypted. And the DynamoDB table, as I said, is just used for locking and unlocking uh, the state so that we can apply safely without, uh, without having conflicts between two separate applies happening at the same time. Now that we have a better understanding of how Terraform state and Terraform backends work, uh, as well as a few different options for hosting remote backends, I'm gonna go ahead and walk through that initial architecture that I described early on in the course and show how we could build this out uh, with the Terraform configuration. That's gonna involve a number of different AWS resources. Now, because this is not an AWS course, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about how I'm configuring each of the things, but I'll walk through each of the elements uh, within the configuration, and then we can apply it and see it come to life. Also, within this uh, basics subdirectory within the course repo, uh, I have two, I have both of the backend configurations that I showed in the, the walkthrough. Uh, for the AWS backend, uh, we've got the definition including the S3 bucket as well as the DynamoDB table. So I've actually already provisioned those and that's the remote backend that I'll be using. So here we can see within uh, the S3 portion, I've got my Terraform state bucket. And then within DynamoDB, I've got my state locking table. And so that's the, the remote backend that I'll be using. Feel free to use Terraform Cloud or continue to use a local backend for now if that suits you best. Within this web app directory, I've defined uh, all of the resources associated with that architecture, that web application architecture. And so let's just walk through that quickly. Then we'll go through the plan and apply steps and see it provisioned within AWS. So you'll notice we now have this additional backend block within the Terraform uh, configuration. This is where I'm specifying that remote backend. Before I didn't have that block and it just assumed I wanted to use a local backend. Uh, I'm using the S3 type and specifying and pointing it to that S3 bucket with that DynamoDB table for locking. Uh, and this is where within the bucket it will store that state. So if it's in the DevOps Directive TF state bucket, it'll be at this prefix. Uh, so I could actually go navigate to that in the bucket and see that file. Also, once again, I'll be using the AWS provider configured to operate within the US East One region. Now, the first two things uh, that I've added here are the two EC2 instances. So this compute portion, uh, the two EC2 instances, I'm using the same operating system as I used in my Hello World example. It's gonna be a T2 micro instance once again. The two new fields here are the security groups, and we have to set up some security groups to enable inbound traffic. Uh, by default, uh, they wouldn't be accessible uh, for inbound traffic. And so because we want this to be a web application, we need traffic to be able to reach it. And then this is kind of a little hack to set up the most simple web server I could. It's a bash script that populates the index.html file with hello world one, uh, and then uses Python to start an HTTP server on port 8080. Uh, I did the exact same thing for a second instance, so we can have multiple replicas of our, of our web application running. Uh, this one has hello world two, uh, and then we start up the web server just as before. So once we've provisioned these, we're actually gonna put a, uh, a load balancer in front of them. So when we refresh the page, we'll be able to see it hitting one instance and then hitting the other. And that's kind of how to demonstrate that. Uh, I'm creating an S3 bucket. I'm not actually using it for anything, but just wanted to show if you did have large files that you wanted to store, you would likely populate those within S3 and maybe store a reference to them within your application database. The configuration for an S3 bucket is quite simple. Uh, I'm just naming it web app data. Uh, and I am gonna turn on server-side encryption. I think by default it is off, so it's, it's useful to go ahead and specify what kind of encryption you want for that bucket on the server side. Uh, when provisioning things, we often need to specify which virtual private cloud VPC and which subnet within that VPC we want our resources to go into. Uh, because I didn't wanna configure a new VPC for this example, I'm actually using the data block here rather than the resource block. So data's data blocks will reference an existing resource within AWS. Uh, so I'm just gonna reference the default VPC, which is created in my account by default, and the default subnet uh, within that VPC. And so I'll reference those later in, in other resources. Like I said, I needed to define some security groups uh, in order to allow inbound traffic. So that's what this is. And then you attach a group rule, a security group rule to that security group. It's kind of like IAM policies where you have uh, the users and then you can attach roles to those users. Uh, here, we have security groups, we attach rules to them. I'm setting it up so we can have inbound traffic on port 8080 
uh, to the instance uh, using TCP protocol uh, and allowing all, uh, all IP addresses uh, for that. Next up, we're gonna uh, set up the load balancer and the configuration uh, for that load balancer to have inbound traffic uh, coming from the, the web. Uh, we have to set up a variety of things. We're gonna be listening on port 80. We're not gonna deal with setting up a certificate and HTTPS. We're just gonna go with standard HTTP to keep things simple. Uh, and this is just kind of the, the way that we configure that load balancer listener such that if we hit a URL that we don't recognize that we haven't configured, it'll return this 404 page. Uh, but if we do get a request that we recognize, we forward that to our, our instances. We can specify where we want to send that traffic by defining a target group. And that target group is gonna contain our EC2 instances uh, with some various health check information. We then need to attach our two EC2 instances into that target group so that uh, the load balancer will know where to send the traffic uh, and on what port. Uh, we need to set up a listener rule so that we can in this case, we're just going to take all paths and forward those along. If you had more specific rules you wanted to set up, you could do so here. We need slightly different security groups for the load balancer in terms of the traffic that it's accepting. Uh, I'm allowing it to have inbound uh, traffic on port 80 and then setting up an egress rule for outbound traffic as well. Finally, with all of that config, with all of that configuration in place, we can define the load, the load balancer itself, tell it which subnet to provision into and which security group to use. The next piece that we'll wanna touch is the Route 53 for DNS. So setting it up so we can type an actual domain into our browser and access our site. So in this case, I'm using a, a domain that I own, devopsdeployed.com, and we provision it as a zone within Route 53. And then each zone can have different records associated with it. And so within the zone, we'll have an A record it takes traffic to devopsdeployed.com and we'll point it at our load balancer. So traffic coming in to devopsdeployed.com, we'll hit our load balancer and that traffic will get forwarded to one of our two EC2 instances. Now, finally, the last piece of our infrastructure is the database. Similar to the S3 bucket, I'm not actually gonna query, I'm not actually gonna set up an application that connects to it. I just wanted to show how we would provision it. And so we've got that database there, and this is the set of config that we need to provision the, the RDS instance. Let's go into our web app directory, run our Terraform init. That's gonna initialize that remote backend. So set up everything we need to, uh, to talk to that S3 bucket and DynamoDB table. And then I'll do a Terraform plan. And this is, because I haven't provisioned this yet, this is gonna, show me a massive plan where it's gonna actually go create all of these resources. So we're adding all 17 of those resources. Uh, nothing exists, so we're not changing anything and, and we're not destroying anything. Uh, this should match our configuration, pretty much everything that I just walked through. And let me just go ahead and do Terraform apply. Uh, it prompts me if I want to apply it. There is a command line flag I can use to avoid that prompt, like if we're doing this within uh, an automated system and, and we'll use that later when we set up a GitHub action to automate some of this. But now it's going off and we can see it creating all of these resources. Some are quite quick, some are slower. I think the RDS instance is probably the slowest, uh, but we can go click around in the interface and start to see things come online. So if we go to EC2, Instances, let me go to the right region. Okay, we've got one instance online. Uh, we've got our load balancers coming up. It's provisioning, we've got Route 53, let's check on that. Uh, we've got a hosted zone, which is what we wanted for devopsdeployed.com. Uh, cool. Uh, now this domain is actually uh, hosted in Google domains. And so I need to update the name servers to use these. 
Yeah, so I'm gonna go under DNS and use custom servers. I, I had it using Cloudflare before, but now I'm gonna update to use these AWS name servers. There, add another. There, one more. Save. And so hopefully that propagates quickly, but it could take some time. Uh, in the meantime, in the meantime, let's go check on that load balancer again. Because even before our DNS name is resolving, we should be able to, um, we should be able to hit the load balancer directly. Okay, so our load balancer is now active uh, and has this uh, DNS name. So if I hit this domain, uh, we see that it has hit our instance number one. If I refresh a few times. Uh, we start to see sometimes it hits number one, sometimes it hits number two. Uh, so that is a good sign that our uh, load balancer is connected to both and we're able to access things accordingly. Um, let me just go to devopsdeployed.com and see if that domain has propagated and it looks like it has. And so when we refresh, sometimes we get uh, one, sometimes we get two, uh, but they are active. And how is our provisioning coming along? So it looks like everything has provisioned except that DB instance. And the RDS instances are one of the slower resources within AWS, so that can take some time. But if we look here, we'll see it uh, in the provisioning state. Go databases, Terraform. And so here is that instance. Uh, it says, okay, the security group is active. The instance itself is available. So does that mean it's done? Yeah. So right after we got there, it finished. We successfully provisioned all of these elements uh, and configured them to work together. Now, if we were actually building this out, there's a number of steps that we would have taken to make our Terraform configuration much cleaner. And as we learn more about the different features of HCL and Terraform throughout this course, we'll be taking this base and extending on it. In this example, we put everything in this main.tf file. It turned it into quite a large file that's kind of difficult to uh, reason about. We would likely have broken that into maybe the different portions of our architecture. So we could have one for compute, one for networking, one for persistent storage, perhaps. Uh, we can start to pull out some things that we've hard coded here into variables. So rather than have a specific machine type here, we could actually have that be a variable and we'll learn how to use variables to do that type of thing. Uh, obviously also, if we had an actual application, we would load that within our instance and instead of our little bash script and we would communicate with the database and the S3 bucket. But because the focus of this course is on the Terraform aspects, uh, I'll mostly be upgrading how we're using this configuration and making it more extensible uh, and cleaner as we move forward. Now, once again, I'm gonna do a Terraform destroy to clean those resources up so I don't end up with a big bill. It says, this will destroy all 17 resources. Yes. And we'll let that deal with that in the background. While that example showing the different components of the web application, how we define those resources and apply those resources, we already have a pretty powerful set of tools under our belt, but we've only just scratched the surface of what the HashiCorp configuration language, HCL, can do. Uh, and in particular, there were a lot of things that were hard coded there that we can break out as variables and make our code much more flexible and much more modular. So in part four, I wanna look at variables and outputs as two features of that HCL language. There's a few different types of variables that we can use within Terraform. The first of which is an input variable, uh, which is referenced using var dot name of variable. So over here on the right, uh, we can have a variable, we'll name that variable instance type, and then that can be a number of different types here. It's a string and we're setting it to T2 micro. So here we might use this if we were provisioning EC2 instances and we wanted to make that configurable such that we ran, uh, we ran our Terraform apply command. We could choose based on a separate variables file, whether we wanted a small instance, a large instance, et cetera. So you can think of input variables like uh, input parameters or arguments for a function. We also have local variables. So these, when you reference them, you use local.name but when we declare them, we use locals plural. So that's an important distinction. 
And these are like the temporary variables within the scope of a function, uh, if you're thinking about it in terms of normal programming languages. Uh, and these just allow me to take a value which is repeated a few times throughout my configuration and pull it into a, a variable that can be reused. So I might say this service is named X or I am the owner of these, uh, these resources. Then finally, there's output variables using that same function analogy. These are like the return value of the function. And these are what allow us to take multiple Terraform configurations and bundle them together. So I might uh, take the output of my apply and return a instance IP address so that a different portion of my Terraform config can consume that uh, and use it to set up configuration elsewhere. So if I need to map uh, or set up a firewall rule so that my uh, so that my web application can talk to my database, I can use an output variable like this to get that to get those data and apply the configuration appropriately. Now, in order to set input variables, there's a number of ways we can actually apply values to those. And these are ranked in order of precedence. So the first on the list is the lowest precedence and the, the final on the list is the highest. And so if you've declared a variable in multiple ways, this is the ordering in which one will be applied over the other. You can, if you don't specify a variable anywhere and there's no default value, when you run the plan command, the Terraform CLI, the command line interface, will prompt you and ask you to put a value in. You generally don't want to be doing it that way because then it makes it very easy to, to make a typo or have a mistake such that the variables change throughout different runs. So you probably want to avoid that first one altogether. The second one is if you have a default value in your block when you declare the variable itself, that's kind of the fallback of what it will use if, if you don't specify a value. You can also use environment variables to specify them. So if you, you need to have that environment variable start with the prefix of tf underscore var underscore and then the name of the variable. This is sometimes useful in CI environments or other environments where you would want to change the value based on different attributes. Uh, you can also define these things within files on your file system. So you can have a terraform.tfvars file which has all the values that you want. And so this can be useful if you want to have maybe a staging one or a production one. You can have different TFRs files for each of those, et cetera. Uh, you also can have any files that's that's a, a wildcard there, that uh, asterisk, .auto.tfvars file. So this can be auto-applied. And these will actually be uh, used over top of whatever you have in your, your TFRs file. And then finally, when you issue your Terraform plan command or your Terraform apply command, you can have a, da a dash var or dash var file option that will pass those in uh, at the time of, that will pass those in at runtime. So that is the highest precedent. So if I specify a dash var on my Terraform apply command, that one's going to be set to that value, even if I've defined it in one of these other ways. There's a number of different value types that these variables can hold. There's some primitive types that uh, you're probably familiar with. You can have a string, you can have a number, or you can have a Boolean, so true, false. There are also a number of more complex types that you can have that can be constructed uh, of those primitive types. You can have lists, sets, maps, et cetera. You're, you're probably familiar with these from other programming languages, so I won't go into too much detail about what they are, uh, but just know that you can define variables that take on these more complex types. And there's also some validation uh, that you can have within Terraform. Type checking happens automatically. So if you specify a variable as a Boolean type and then you try to pass it a number, that will, Terraform will throw an error when you try to use that command. And so that's very useful to help us avoid uh, issues with, with passing the wrong values into these variables. You can also write your own validation rules that can be applied. And so that can be a powerful technique to avoid having issues or to run some automated testing against your code base to do some static checks to make sure that uh, your configurations are using the types of things that you that you care about. I mentioned before how sensitive data gets handled a little bit within the state file, but it is important to think about, oftentimes you will use variables to pass those sensitive data in. So you might be passing in a database password, for example. You want to set uh, the attribute sensitive equals true when you're defining uh, those variables. Uh, if you are passing it in, you don't want to have it in a, in a file. So those are, those are a great candidate for using that tf underscore var environment variable approach or using the dash var command and retrieve the value for that from, let's say, AWS Secrets Manager uh, or uh, HashiCorp Vault when you're issuing that command. You also can use an external secret store uh, 
Uh, and so you can reference one of those secret stores within your Terraform configuration, and then you use the output variables to pull those into other portions of your config. When you have sensitive data stored within uh, an object within Terraform, you'll see when it outputs the plan to the command line, it will mask those. So here, let's say it had a password, it would put parentheses, sensitive, et cetera, so that you're not leaking those credentials wherever you're running these Terraform commands. Now that we know about Terraform variables and outputs, uh, I wanna show a couple of examples and then apply to our web application configuration to make it a little bit more generalizable. Uh, first, we've got this examples directory here. Uh, in a main.tf file, as always, we need to define our backend and our providers. Um, I'm showing how you could use a local variable here. So local variables, as I described, are things that are scoped to within this project, and we can't actually pass them in at runtime. It's a way to define a variable that will get reused throughout the configuration, so that if it does change, we don't have to update that in all the different places. Uh, within this main configuration, I've got an, in, uh, an EC2 instance defined, as well as a database instance. You'll notice, though, that now, instead of uh, passing in a hard-coded string for the instance type and the uh, AMI, I'm passing those in as variables. Uh, and those variables are actually defined uh, within this variables.tf file. They don't have to be in a separate file. They could be in the main file. Uh, but I've pulled them out here so that we have sort of a nice clean place where it, defi it defines all the different variables that we can input uh, when we use this configuration. Uh, so we're passing in instance name, AMI, instance type, DB user, and DB pass. So these are all inputs to this Terraform configuration uh, that I can configure uh, and, uh, and change at runtime. The next concept that we talked about is the tfvars file. So this is where I can define the values for these variables. So if they're non-sensitive, I'm just going to put them in here. So for example, I'm going to name my instance hello world. It's going to use this AMI and it's going to use that instance type. Uh, you'll notice I did not put uh, the password in here because that one we wouldn't want to define in our code base because that is sensitive. And so we're going to pass that in a different way. We also can have more than one tfvars file. By default, it's going to apply. Uh, if we name the file terraform.tfrs, that would get applied. If we have some other file name, uh, then we have to explicitly tell it when we do a terraform apply. We would need to do terraform apply dash var file equals and then path to that uh, additional file, uh, tfrs file. Uh, I also added a couple of outputs to this just as, as samples of what you might uh, include. For example, we might want access to the IP address of the instance once it's provisioned, or we might want access to the IP address of that uh, database when it's provisioned. Finally, in the database configuration, I specified the username and password as variables. Uh, so we can apply those. We could put them in the TFRs file, but because they're sensitive, we likely want to pass them in at runtime. Uh, so we would do terraform apply dash var. And then we can specify, for example, db user equals my user. Uh, we can pass another var equals db pass equals something super, super secure. Uh, and so those would get passed in at runtime. Ideally, we're automating all this. And so these sensitive values can be stored in something like a GitHub secret uh, or maybe stored in AWS Secret Manager and accessed within that Git, uh, GitHub action, et cetera. But we want to avoid putting these sensitive data into our configuration itself. And the variable and variables are the way that we can achieve that. Also, when we define that password variable, the DB pass, we want to make sure to set sensitive true. And that way, when we run the Terraform apply, it won't actually echo that out into the terminal like it would some of these other variables. So those are just some basic examples. Now I'll show you what I went through and changed about our web application itself. Here are the variables that I added. Uh, I'm allowing us to choose a region that we want to deploy into. Uh, for EC2, I defined, similar to the example, which machine we want to use, as well as the instance type. Uh, for S3, I'm allowing us to set the bucket name dynamically with a variable. For Route 53, we can switch which domain we're actually using. 
For RDS, I'm allowing us to set the, the name of the database, the database user, as well as the database password. So as I was thinking about what we wanted to parameterize for this application, I tried to choose the set of things that would allow us to deploy multiple copies of a similar but slightly different web application. And this was the set that I, that I thought made sense. Also, I'm passing back the IP addresses of our two instances and the IP address of the database instance in case we wanted to consume those in either another Terraform configuration or some other piece of our automation. Within the main Terraform configuration, I've now updated all those references so that wherever they're being used, I'm passing in the var dot and then the name of the variable. For example, here. And by using variables in this way, I'll actually be able to down the line deploy a staging and a production environment simply by configuring different variable values. Within my terraform.vars file, I've included uh, the values for each of these. I've included the values for each of these variables, except for db pass, which I would want to pass in at runtime as I described. Now, I'm not going to go through and actually do the Terraform apply here. The process would be exactly the same as before. We would do a Terraform init, a Terraform plan, a Terraform apply. The only difference would be that now that we have these outputs, once we finish the apply step, it would actually log these out and provide access to those uh, output variables from our configuration. As you saw, we were able to refactor our example code to use variables and outputs to make it much more uh, expressive and modular. We were able to create multiple copies of the infrastructure just by changing those input variables. Now let's take a look at some of the more advanced language features and how we can start to use them to improve our code even further. I've listed out a bunch of things here. I'm mostly just going to call them out as things that exist. And you should really use the Terraform documentation, which is quite good, to understand how exactly to use these things. Uh, but we have access to expressions on the left-hand side here. So we can do things like template strings. So if you're familiar with how you can have a, a string in JavaScript with, uh, with a curly braces inside and reference a variable from within that string, we can do similar things here where we can build strings dynamically. We also have a number of operators which behave like you might expect from a programming language, from a programming language with uh, multiplication, division, uh, checking equality, et cetera. We can use conditionals. So it's, it's similar to a, a ternary syntax here where you have a condition and then if it is true, you do one thing. If it is false, you do another. So that's a pretty powerful construct. We also can use a for list. So if we want to, let's say, have a listing of configurations and loop over them to do uh, something a number of different times, it allows us to have a configuration that we don't have to repeat the same code over and over. Uh, we also can uh, splat. So by that, I mean take the values in a list and expand them out over some uh, way in which we want to use them. Uh, there's dynamic blocks. There's constraints we can use to check typing and, and versions of things. And so, like I said, use the docs for those. Uh, we have a number of different functions. So things uh, like math functions that we can do on numbers. We have uh, date and time functionality built in where if we wanted to have something that is named after uh, the specific timestamp at which it was created, or if we need to use the hash and crypto functions to generate a password on the fly, et cetera. So there, there's a bunch of built-in functions within the language that, that you'll want to use the documentation to understand how to use these within your code base. And we'll see this as we go through and, and continue to build out our examples. We'll use some of these functions to help make our, our code better and better. Now, there's also a concept of a meta argument. Uh, there's, there's a number of these, but one specifically that I want to call out here is the depends on meta argument. And so normally, if there's things that need to happen in a certain sequence, if you're like provisioning a server and then you need the IP address from that to pass to a firewall rule or, or what have you, just by passing those data and saying uh, EC2 example dot output and putting that into the configuration for the, the, the other resource, Terraform, when you run the plan or apply command, will figure out the sequence of events and the, the dependency graph there. There are cases, though, where one resource implicitly depends on another, but there's no direct connection within the config. And so an example here shown on the right is that here, if my instance needs to be able to access an S3 bucket, I need to have a role policy that can make that happen. 
but there's no direct connection within my config. And so I can tell Terraform what this depends on key. Oh, you should make sure to provision this role policy before you provision the instance. Otherwise it's going to fail. And so this allows me to give some hints to that, uh, the parsing and the, the dependency graph generation to ensure ordering matches what it needs to be. There's also another meta argument uh, count, and this allows me to specify if I need multiple of the same configuration provisioned, I can use this count meta argument and it will provision multiple copies. And so usually this would be used with a, let's say a module where I have a single block and I wanna make multiple copies of it. And so here, this configuration on the right would provision four copies of this instance by passing that count into, by passing count into the resource. And then I can change the tags using count.index so that each one will be named server one, server two, et cetera. It's very useful to use this if you have multiple necessary resources that are nearly identical. Another important meta argument to call out is the for each meta argument. This is kind of like the count argument, but it gives us much more control over each resource. So whereas count, we literally just get one, two, three, four, et cetera. Here, we're taking an iterable of some kind and we're using those to create the multiple resources. So in the example, let's say we had two subnet IDs up there on the top. We can then take those subnet IDs and go through them and do a for each where each of those subnet IDs is used in our AWS instance config. It allows us to very easily define copies of things while still maining the necessary control to individualize them as needed. We also have a lifecycle meta argument. Uh, and this is important because there are certain things where we need Terraform to take actions in a specific order. And so we can use the create before destroy uh, argument to say, if we're replacing this server, we want you to provision the new one before you delete the old one. And so this can help us to avoid downtime for our applications if we do this properly. Uh, there are also some times where behind the scenes, after you've provisioned a resource, AWS or whatever service you're using will add some metadata to that resource. Those can be very annoying from a, a Terraform state perspective because it looks as though you have a change between your state and the deployed infrastructure. And so you can tell Terraform, oh, yes, that tag exists. We don't need to worry about it. And you can put that within the ignore changes uh, lifecycle meta tag. And so otherwise you can end up in a state where you're trying to revert those changes back and forth and you're kind of fighting with the, the system. The other meta argument lifecycle tag that I'll call out here is the prevent destroy tag. And so this is kind of a safeguard. If you have some piece of your infrastructure that is critical to not delete, you can add this tag. And then anytime, if the plan command, if the, the Terraform plan or apply would have deleted that resource, it will throw an error. And so this can help you uh, really lock down some specific core pieces of the infrastructure that you don't want to be uh, de deleted. Another important concept within Terraform is the concept of a provisioner. And a provisioner allows you to perform some action either locally or on a remote machine. There's a number of different type of provisioners. There's a file of provisioners, local exec, remote exec, et cetera. There's also sometimes vendors publish a sp specific provisioner that allows your Terraform config to essentially call out to one of these other tools and do whatever it needs to do. So maybe if we're using that pattern I talked about with uh, Terraform as a provisioning tool and Ansible as a configuration management tool, perhaps you, once you've finished your application of your Terraform config and you have your server up, you can use the Ansible provisioner to then go off and install and modify uh, those servers, et cetera. And so these provisioners are how you would go about actually making that happen within your, your configuration. Or in a more simple example, we could have, let's say, a startup script that we wanted to execute after we have provisioned our servers. And so that could be a file provisioner with a bash script uh, stored there that the Terraform configuration could reference. Uh, so those are just some examples of how these provisioners would be used. For this part of the course, I haven't actually made any direct changes to the configuration of our web application. We will start to use some of these language features as we do things like break it out into a staging and production environment, we'll start to look at using conditionals. 
and other language features. In this portion of the repo, I've just included a, a short readme that summarizes some of the various features here. Uh, but really, the best place is to go within the Terraform documentation here uh, and use it directly, because it's going to have the most up-to-date and detailed reference available. In this next section of the course, I want to talk about how you should be organizing your projects and how to use modules to make your code reusable, as well as we'll take a look at how to use external modules uh, if we want to provision something that is pre-configured by someone else. So what exactly is a module? It's essentially a container for taking multiple resources that we've uh, defined within our Terraform configuration uh, and bundling them up in a reusable fashion. And it just consists of a collection of our .tf, our Terraform files, uh, and or our .terraform.json files, if we structured them as JSON files, and we keep them together within a single directory. Uh, so we've already been using a module so far. We just put everything into kind of that default module. But in this in this section, we're going to show how to break those out and bundle them up in a, a reusable fashion. And it's the main way that we can take our Terraform configurations and reuse them uh, across projects or across environments uh, or share them externally if we, if we think third parties might find them useful. Why would we care about doing this? Uh, and so we've got all these software engineers. And so we've got our web application. We've got some asynchronous processing uh, system. We've got microservice A, B, and C. And so here, everyone needs to know a little bit about everything. And that is not typically the breakdown that we want within our organization. We want to be able to have some people who can specialize in infrastructure and other people who can specialize in application development. Uh, you can't expect everyone to know everything. And so in order to make this manageable, we need to break down the system into different components. And so maybe we have a handful of infrastructure specialists who are really good at Terraform. Hopefully that will be you after completing this course. Uh, and they can define the infrastructure around how we want to deploy our web app and how we want to deploy our batch processing system and how we want to deploy our microservices. And they can abstract that away from the application developers who can then consume it. So maybe for my web application, that my company is deploying, I need a web server, I need a database, I need some networking config, and I can bundle that all up in a Terraform module that an application developer can then say, I have my Ruby on Rails app, I just need to plug in these specific values, provision a copy of this Terraform module, and now I'm good to go. And I can have the best practices that the infrastructure specialist knows and has baked into this config uh, without needing to understand fully what's going on uh, under the hood and learn Terraform to, to a great extent. There's a few different types of modules. Uh, I, I mentioned before we've been using modules uh, because the default module is just every TF file in the main working directory. So kind of by default, by accident, we've been using this root module. We also can have child modules, which is a separate module that we reference from our root module. These modules can come in through a variety of sources. Uh, if they're all in the same uh, file system, we can have local paths. So I can have a directory A and a directory B, and I can reference one from the other. So that's the local paths. These also can be in the Terraform registry. So like the providers live in a registry on Terraform, uh, Terraform system, we can also uh, have modules that live in a remote registry, and we can reference those directly. We can have modules that live in GitHub and, and reference them via a, a GitHub URL or other version control systems. Uh, they could live in S3 buckets. So there's a number of ways that we can reference these, uh, but just knowing how to do it uh, for various examples is the important piece here. A local path, as I was saying, you would, you would just use a relative path from your root module to wherever that child module lives. So let's say I'm, I'm building my module web app and it is in a directory that is a sibling to my current root module, I would just use the dot dot for parent directory, reference the web app directory. If it's living in the Terraform registry, uh, we would uh, specify it like such. So the source would be whatever organization slash name of uh, module. And so that's how we would do that. And you, you can pin a version so that you don't have any surprises about it changing in the background. 
for GitHub uh, modules, you would reference it using either uh, over HTTPS, like the first example, or via SSH. Uh, in the second example, this is GitHub specific syntax. Uh, you can also do any generic Git repo with a username uh, and password as shown in the, the example at the bottom there. Similar to how we would pin a version for the uh, Terraform registry, we also probably want to pin a version for the Git sources. In previous sections, we looked at input variables and how they can be used when we're issuing our commands. Those were for the root module, but e each child module can also be passed inputs in a similar fashion. Uh, so we can specify whatever the developer of the module has exposed as an input variable, we can specify. And this is how we can have one module that is very generic and applicable to a variety of different sources. Uh, so we can uh, specify things like the bucket name or the, or the domain. And we'll see this when we actually refactor the example code uh, and add, turn it into a module. These are the types of things that we will want as input variables to that module itself. You can also then use the meta arguments that we talked about before. Like if we want to have multiple copies of this, we would use the count or the for each meta argument to specify the number of copies and the attributes of those copies. Uh, similarly, we can use the providers and the uh, depends on meta arguments as well. Now, what makes a good module? You can put anything you want in a module. You could have a mega module that had everything you wanted. You could have a tiny module that's just a very thin wrapper over one of the a resource from a specific provider. But there's a number of attributes that make a module useful. And I've listed here a number of attributes that make a module useful. So we want to raise the abstraction level from the base resource type. So if your module is just a super thin wrapper over the resource within the AWS provider, it's not going to provide that much utility to the end user. They may as well just use the, uh, the resource directly. But if we can take a set of resources that should be logically grouped and put them into a, a, a configuration that are usable with just a few input variables, that's where you can really get some value of having it modularized. You would want to, as I was saying, group these resources into a logical uh, grouping and have the necessary inputs so that I, as an individual developer, can get what I need out of it. Uh, if, if I don't have access to a specific configuration that I should have access to, that module doesn't, doesn't really add any value for me because I need to then uh, interact with that resource directly. We also should always try to have defaults for the values that will give us a useful and a usable uh, output. Having useful defaults will make a, a, the onboarding experience much nicer so that if one of the consuming developers isn't sure what value to use, as if they use the default, they'll end up with, with a working uh, nice setup. And then we also want to make sure that if there's any outputs from our resources that would be useful for other infrastructure to go along with our module, we need to return those as outputs so that we can integrate our module with other systems. And so these are kind of the five things that I would think about as I'm building modules and making sure that they're gonna be useful for my team or for external parties that are gonna be use, uh, using those modules. We've talked about the different sources. This is the Terraform registry and what it looks like. In addition to providers, you see there's a tab there for modules. Uh, there's many different modules associated with AWS and, and other providers that you can use as a starting point. For example, we could have a specific module like the security group module. Within this, it will uh, help us to provision a security group within AWS with the necessary configurations associated with it. Now that we have an understanding of how modules work within Terraform, I'm gonna do a few things within this demo portion. First, I'll show how we can consume a third-party module and I'll deploy this uh, console module. Console is another HashiCorp tool, and we will deploy it using this third-party module. It is available via the Terraform registry. And I just wanna show how we can take advantage of them configuring this system with a lot of the best practices and exposing the key uh, input variables to us. So they've abstracted away a lot of the complexity that would be required to run console. If we look at this readme, we can see that this is actually gonna deploy a ton of resources behind the scenes 
but they've only exposed the important pieces that we would want to make when actually going about and deploying this so that we can let them handle most of the setup and we can configure it to match our needs. So I'll just go ahead and show you this within the, the console subdirectory, I've got a main.tf. Uh, again, we always set up our backend and providers, uh, but then we can just reference the console module via the GitHub repo that it is stored in. And so if I navigate to that directory, do a Terraform init, and then a Terraform plan, you'll see this would actually provision 52 different resources within uh, our AWS account. So things ranging from EC2 instances uh, to networking policies to IAM roles. And so console is this relatively complex system for doing thing, for automating a lot of the network setup and discovery uh, if you have many different services. It would be very difficult for us to go off and deploy this, but because they've built a public module, we can actually consume that module and just configure it exactly how we need uh, using the smaller set of input variables that they've exposed to us. Now let's take a look at the web application that we're building and configuring and see how we can turn that into a more modular configuration. And so the first major thing that you'll see if I go here, I've broken it up into those different portions of the architecture. Uh, I've put the compute in one place that's going to contain the EC2 instance definitions. The database is here. Uh, storage is going to contain the S3 definition, networking, et cetera. So I've broken it up into the different components. I've kept our variables.tf file. I've added a few here that we can take a look at, uh, including the environment name. So this is going to allow us to split on dev versus staging versus production uh, and avoid some naming conflicts because I'm deploying into a single AWS account. Um, but with, so now our main.tf, all it contains is this base block uh, in which we specify that we do need that AWS provider. And then each of these blocks, I've copied and pasted out the definitions of our specific resources into the corresponding uh, .tf file. You'll also see we don't have a tfvars file here. We'll define the tfvars file where we actually consume this module. And so I've got the web app module here. In this web app directory, I've got our main.tf file, and I'm going to show how we can consume our module and deploy two different copies of it uh, very easily from within this one configuration. So I'm setting up our backend and required providers as usual. I'm then setting up a couple of variables that we're going to want to pass into our configuration. Let's say we want two different passwords, one for database one and one for database two. These are of type string and are sensitive. Uh, we can then reference the module using uh, the relative path, since these are both in the same file system. So I'm just going up a directory into web app module. And then I define all the input variables that that module consumes. So as whereas before, we had a tfvars file that we were passing in uh, at runtime. Now, this module has those variables defined. And when I consume it, I define all the different values here, uh, except I I once again want to keep my password, which is a sensitive value, out of my code base. So I pass that in as a variable to as a variable to this configuration, and then that gets passed through to the module that we're provisioning. I can then have a separate block where I define another copy of the web app where everything is quite similar, except I've incremented this from one to two. And so just by having these two blocks, I can consume that module in two places and have a slightly different configuration. Uh, so here maybe we're deploying devopsdeploy.com, and then here we could deploy another devopsdeploy.com. I'll go ahead and actually apply this, and we'll see two copies of our web application being provisioned into the account. Make sure we're initialized, and then I'll apply. Uh, because I didn't pass that uh, DB password, DB pass one or DB pass two on the command line, it actually is going to ask me for them here in the prompt. So I'll just enter some values. And that should be enough for now to go off and provision two copies of my web app. I'll speed things up while that's creating. As you can see, instead of two instances, we now have four instances provisioning. So everything that we were provisioning from before in our web app is now going to be doubled. We'll have two databases, 
two S3 buckets, four EC2 instances, two load balancers, uh, and all the corresponding configuration that goes along with them. Once again, it's the load balancer and the database instances that are taking the longest to create. Uh, okay, it looks like all those resources were added. The apply is complete. And so we have two copies of our web app now uh, running across four EC2 instances in AWS. So hopefully that gives you an idea of now how we can breaking up our Terraform code into the relevant uh, sections so it's just easier to follow and easier to read, parameterizing it with variables so that we can pass in uh, the key information to dif differentiate between different environments, abstract a lot of complexity within that module so that as a consumer of the module, uh, we just pick the key values that we want, uh, pass those in, and we can provision one or more copies of that module very easily. Now I'm just gonna destroy. and we can continue on. Now that we've seen how we can take our example configuration and modularize it and deploy it using that module, as well as to consume a, a complex third-party module like that console deployment, you should have a pretty good idea of how to build a configuration using Terraform. Now I wanna move into how we use Terraform to manage multiple environments. So if you think about having your web application, like this example that we've been building, uh, it's built with these different components and that's great. And we've defined those as a Terraform configuration that we can deploy. But now in addition to a production environment, we also want a staging environment. Uh, we want to have them be very similar so that we can be confident as we make changes, we can test them out in staging and see how it goes. We also may want a development environment that we're deploying to all the time rapidly changing, testing things. And so we wanna take our single config or module and deploy it multiple times. And there's two main approaches that people use uh, when doing this sort of thing. Uh, the first of which is a concept called workspaces. And so this is how you can use multiple named sections within a single remote backend. So if we've got our S3 backend or our Terraform Cloud backend, we can, uh, use the Terraform workspaces command to create and manage uh, these different environments or workspaces that live as different files within our, different state files within our backend. Uh, and so we could say, uh, switch to the dev workspace, deploy that, switch to the staging workspace, deploy that. Uh, and so that is one method. Uh, the other method is to break things out as different subdirectories within your uh, file system. And so here we see on the right, we can have our modules directory, which has the different modules that we built. And then we can have a dev staging and production subdirectory, which consume those modules in different ways. And these two approaches have pros and cons that I'll talk through here uh, in a second. Now, Terraform workspaces are good in some ways and bad in others. They are easy to get started with. It's very convenient because within your Terraform files, you can reference Terraform.workspace as an expression to, let's say, populate the name of your resource. So you could call your database the staging database or the production database. And so it can, it can make it very easy to uh, handle that. It also minimizes the amount of code duplication you have uh, between your different environments. So you have one copy and you're deploying it multiple times uh, through these different portions of your remote backend. The downside to workspaces is that if you are interacting with these things manually, it can be very easy to forget which workspace you happen to have configured and make a change and apply it to the wrong environment. So let's say you made some change, you thought you were in staging, but you were actually in production and you hit the button, it causes an issue and that's, that's no good. So if you are manually interacting with this thing, workspaces can be dangerous from that perspective. If you've automated a lot of this and it's all happening from within a pipeline, that can be less of an issue, but it's still something to think about. Another con is that the state files are all stored within that same remote backend. And so permissioning and access to those different environments, uh, you can't really isolate them. So if someone has access to the uh, development space, someone then also generally has access to the production space. 
within the cloud offering to, uh, that Terraform uh, HashiCorp provides, there is some some more nuanced uh, configuration there. But if you're using a, a self-managed backend, this can be a challenge. Also, just by looking at the code base, you can't tell specifically what's deployed everywhere. You can tell we have this configuration, but until you've done until you've issued some Terraform commands, you can't tell. Oh, here are all the places this is deployed, and here is those are those specific configurations. So it can be a challenge just looking at the code base to reason about specifically what's deployed everywhere. Now, the alternative option that I described uh, is to put these things into different subdirectories within your file system. Uh, this is nice for a few reasons. One, you can isolate the backends. You can have a separate backend configuration for production, from staging, from development, uh, which is good from a security pr perspective. You can handle uh, the permissions for those backends differently. It also, I think, decreases the potential for human error of thinking you're operating in one workspace while you're actually operating in another. Uh, and then finally, looking at the code base, it fully represents the deployed state. So you can see, here's my production config, here's the variables I'm using, uh, and here's the staging config, and here's the different variables I'm using. And you can look at it and very clearly see, we've got these environments deployed, and here is here are their configurations. Some of the cons here are that because now these are living at different places in the file system, if we want to apply to each of them, we've got to navigate between uh, those subdirectories and issue those multiple Terraform apply commands. Also, we have more code duplication than in the workspaces style uh, because each of these uh, main.tfs represents a very similar configuration uh, and therefore that code duplication, it can be hard to keep things in sync across them. Uh, and so that could be considered a downside there. Now, depending how complex our infrastructure is, we probably want to start separating things out into not just having a single massive Terraform config for all of our infrastructure. If you're a small company with, with just one or a few applications, then maybe having everything in one Terraform config is fine. But as your organization starts to grow and your infrastructure becomes more complex, you probably want to break things out into logical component groups rather than have everything bundled into one section. So let's say here, let's say we want to break our compute away from our networking. Uh, if one changes more frequently than the other, that can be a good way to think about how to break things up. Uh, but on the right-hand side, we've shown how our file structure continues to grow and get more complex as we break things out. There's also the ability for us to uh, reference state from a module or a configuration, which is completely separate from our current configuration. So let's say I had deployed my, uh, I keep using this example because it's a good one. I had deployed my infrastructure, my compute infrastructure. So I've got some EC2 instances that are deployed with one configuration and I need to go grab the IP addresses for those. I can actually reference that remote backend uh, from another config entirely so that I can pull those, those variables across the two and keep them in sync without them necessarily needing to be in the same project. So that Terraform remote state is a, a powerful concept to think about when you want to break things out into individual isolated configurations while still being able to reference uh, pieces of the infrastructure that live elsewhere. I talked about pros and cons of each of those approaches uh, and why we would want to use one over the other. There's also some sort of meta tooling that can be applied on top of Terraform that can make our lives easier and really help to manage some of the complexity that comes with breaking things out into that file structure and keeping our configurations dry. Don't repeat yourself uh, so that we can avoid repeated code, avoid having to issue lots of commands across multiple Terraform configs. There's this tool from Gruntworks uh, called TerraGrunt that helps us to do that type of thing. So if you start to find that that complexity is growing and you want to wrangle it, uh, definitely look into this tool, TerraGrunt, to help automate and simplify the operations associated with building out multiple environment configs like that. It also helps us if we want to use multiple cloud accounts. So if we need to be switching uh, our AWS account to isolate a staging environment from a production environment, that can be a little clunky. Uh, using a tool like TerraGrunt can help immensely in, in simplifying that. For this portion of the demo, I've gone ahead and implemented the two approaches I've described for managing multiple environments, both using the Terraform Workspaces feature, as well as using the directory structure within our project to manage those different environments. 
I'll walk through the changes that I had to make and some of the trade-offs and show you how those approaches work. So first let's go through the workspaces approach. Uh, within the uh, 07 module here, within the repo, I've got a workspaces directory with a main.tf file. This is very similar to what we did before in, in the previous portion of the course where we were deploying from the module containing our web application. As always, we set up our backend with S3 and the required providers. We then set up a variable so that we can pass in that sensitive value for the password. Then we can also take advantage of the fact that this workspace has a name and we can use that to do things like postfix certain resources to avoid naming conflicts. So here we're creating an S3 bucket and those are globally scoped. So you need to have different names for the two. So I'm just appending uh, the environment name to the end of it. Uh, and this is exactly like we saw before. We need to populate all the invariables that our module takes in as an input so that it knows uh, uh, how to go off and provision that environment. Another thing that I'm doing here is using a conditional. So because the DNS zone is gonna be global across the two environments, I'm saying, if I'm in production, go ahead and provision that zone. If I'm not in production, don't use it. And instead, if it's staging or development, I'll use the DNS zone that already exists. I can also use my environment name within the database name to avoid a naming conflict there. Uh, and that is essentially all we need to define an environment. Then we can use the Terraform workspace command, Terraform, uh, I'll just make sure we're initialized. and we can use the Terraform workspace command. Uh, I'll use list and it'll tell me, okay, you're currently operating in the default environment. I wanna create a new environment called production. And so to do that, I'll do Terraform workspace, new production. If I do list again, now I'm in that production environment that I just created and I can do Terraform apply. Because I didn't specify a TFVARS file for that database password, I'm just gonna pass it in at runtime. Again, if we're actually doing this in production, we would wanna automate this process and store that secret value in a, a dedicated secret store. Okay, it's gonna add the 17 resources just like it always does. I'll go ahead and speed things up while that completes. Also, while that's working, I'll point out the other side of this conditional, uh, and that is that within the module that we defined in the previous part of the course, uh, in the DNS portion, I'm actually here, I have a resource for the zone as well as a data block for the zone. And that allows us to, uh, depending on this input variable of whether the Boolean, of whether or not we want to create DNS zone, if yes, uh, like we had there in production, it will go off and create that with our domain. If no, instead, it will assume that it's already created and look it up and use that as a data source. And that's what this uh, zero slash one on the count means. If it's a one, we will actually create this resource. If it's a zero, we will skip it. Here, if it's a zero, we'll skip the data object. And if it's a one, we'll look it up. And so that allows us to toggle for that global zone that's shared across the two environments, whether or not we wanna use the resource object or the data object. And because for our staging environment, we're gonna use a subdomain, whereas production, we're not. Here, in my locals, I'm setting based on which environment I'm in. If it's production, I set this subdomain to an empty string. If it is any other environment, I use that environment name to set up the subdomain value that gets put into this record. So here we're taking advantage of some of those additional language features, including conditionals, setting this count value so that we do or do not actually use those resources, et cetera. Now, I just updated those name servers again. If I were using this setup in, in a true production environment, I would wanna automate the setting of those name servers. And there is a provider for Google Domain, so I could either continue to host the DNS within Route 53 and update these name servers automatically, or I could just use Terraform to set A records directly on my Google Domain's account. I didn't wanna go through the setup of an additional provider here, but just know that that is how you would handle it if you wanted to fully automate setting up that process. Okay, it looks like our production environment has finished deploying. Uh, now let's go ahead and create a staging environment. So I can do Terraform workspace new staging 
if I list them out, it'll show me that I have the default staging and production, and I'm currently in staging. So if I do Terraform apply, I'm now gonna provision another copy of my web app, but now the environment name is staging and those conditionals will be set so that it'll deploy to staging.devopsdeployed.com and set all the necessary values accordingly. So here we've got our web app at, here we've got our web app at devopsdeployed.com as usual. Uh, as this comes online, we should get an additional site that we can access at staging.devopsdeployed.com. Com. Okay, it looks like that record is now created. So if I go into the interface here, we can see in addition to our devopsdeployed.com, we now also have staging.devopsdeployed.com. And so if I hit that URL, staging.devopsdeployed.com, it could take a second or two to propagate. And now it has propagated. And so there we go. We've got two copies of our app, one running at devopsdeploy.com, another uh, at staging.devopsdeploy.com. And these are two isolated environments that we've provisioned from the same code base using the Terraform workspace feature. I'll destroy both of these and then show you how we can use the file structure to achieve a same, to achieve a very similar result. All right, so I'll do Terraform destroy. Now with both environments destroyed, I'll show you what it looks like to use a directory layout within our file system to organize the different environments. So within this file structure subdirectory, let me navigate there. Uh, we have three subdirectories. We have a global, a production, and a staging subdirectory. Global is for anything that is shared across the multiple environments. So in this case, it's gonna contain a reference to our Route 53 zone specifically, because that's used for both of these things. Uh, and so it's got our normal Terraform block up at the top. And then we're just deploying this Route 53 zone within that global subdirectory. Then within our production and staging subdirectories, we have a main.tf file that defines the all of the options that we need for that module that we're deploying. So it looks very similar to before. Um, the one difference here is that now for both production and staging, I'm setting create DNS zone to false because that's going to be handled outside of these two, outside of these two within that global subdirectory. So the first step here for deploying this would be going into the global subdirectory and deploying that zone, and then we could deploy either production or staging from that point. So I'll go into global. We initialize here. Then we'll do Terraform apply. This is only creating that zone because that's the only resource that's shared across the two different environments. Okay, that's completed. So now I could navigate into the production folder, for example. Uh, again, Terraform init to make sure we're initialized. And then a Terraform apply here would apply that resource. I could then go into staging and do the same thing. You get the idea. So why would this approach be potentially beneficial over the workspaces approach? Uh, one, I can very clearly look at my directory file structure and see, okay, here's everything that's deployed. I have a global group, I have a production group, and I have a staging group. I could store my TFVARS files within there and very easily see what environments I have deployed and how my configuration maps onto those. With the workspaces approach, 
all we have is that main.tf. And until we actually have Terraform installed and start issuing uh, Terraform workspace list, et cetera, uh, we won't know what is, is deployed. And so it's much easier to look at the code base and reason about the actual infrastructure we have deployed using this file system based uh, organizational approach. One downside is that we do have a little bit more code repetition, right? Uh, instead of just that single main.tf, we have a main.tf in each of our environments. There's a little bit of duplication there. We also are specifying uh, when setting up the backend provider, we can't use some of the Terraform variables features. So we can't actually template in uh, things within this backend. So we do end up having things like our bucket and our DynamoDB table hard coded in these configurations. And so that's definitely a bit of a downside. As I mentioned, there is some tooling such as TerraGrunt that can help automate some of this stuff. Uh, but I just wanted to showcase the two different options. Uh, I personally prefer this file system approach, especially if you layer on some of that additional automation, uh, but either can be a good approach. And if you're using Terraform Cloud, they do a nice job of highlighting your different workspaces within their UI. And so that can be a good way uh, to get started with doing multiple environments. And as long as you're automating most of this workflow and ensuring that you have protections against manually executing a Terraform apply or destroy in the wrong workspace, it is still a very viable option for managing multiple environments. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the different trade-offs of how to go about doing this. And you can make that decision within your own project of how you would like to manage this sort of thing. With an understanding of how we should organize our code and manage different environments with Terraform, I want to talk about a concept that is fairly new to the infrastructure world, and that is how we can use testing like we would use with software development to ensure that our infrastructure's code configurations are high quality and continuing to perform how we want them to. In order to know why this is useful, you need to think about the concept of code rot. So uh, code rot in general refers to this concept that over time, uh, things change about your software systems. And if you don't test and use code, it will oftentimes uh, degrade over time. That could be due to external dependencies changing. Uh, that could be due to other changes in your code base that are impacting your specific this specific uh, function. In particular, with Terraform and with infrastructure, uh, the types of rot that we might see are out of band changes. So if I deploy something with Terraform and then uh, my colleague goes in and changes something via the UI, that is now a misconfiguration that could be a challenge. We could have unpinned versions. So if we forgot to specify a specific version of our provider and it just used the latest one, that could cause a conflict if that provider was upgraded in the background. Let's Another example could be if we're depending on an external module or a specific resource type within the cloud provider and that was then deprecated, that would be another instance of, of code rot. Uh, and then the final one that I'll bring up here is if we have made a change to our infrastructure config, our Terraform config, but that never got applied to a specific environment. Uh, let's say we, we rolled it out to staging, but we forgot because we didn't automate it, uh, how to, we forgot to actually apply that to production. So that unapplied change now is a conflict between our, our config file and our state file. And so how do we prevent these types of code rot? And the way that we prevent that is by testing our code. Uh, there's a number of different types of tests that we can do. There are static checks. So we can uh, scan our code base with a variety of different tools. There's some that are built into, our, uh, into the Terraform binary itself. We can run the Terraform format command and that gives us an opinionated formatting of how we should indent and structure the code base, making sure that everyone adheres to the same style. Uh, there's a Terraform validate, which does a check to see, are my configurations using all, setting all of the required input variables and that sort of thing? Uh, or am I passing a, a name? Am I passing a Boolean to a number variable, et cetera? So that's kind of what Terraform validate will check. Terraform plan will go off and tell us if, uh, if our what needs to happen to get from our desired config to a, an eventual state of those resources being deployed. And so that can be a great way to check if something has changed out of band. Is if I run a Terraform plan command and it says zero changes required, that means we're good to go. Our, our config has not been modified. If I run a Terraform plan and it says we need to issue these four commit, we need to change these four things, that means something happened. If Unless I changed my config and I wanted those changes, if I haven't changed my config, that means something happened out of band. So 
often a good check is to just run a Terraform plan command once a, a day or once a week. Uh, and if it says that there's changes needed, but there's been no change to the config, that, that indicates that something could be wrong. Uh, and then as we talked about in a, a previous section, you can define custom validation rules uh, around uh, the types of infrastructure that you're provisioning. So that can be a powerful way uh, to use the Terraform tool itself to do some validation on your configurations. There's also some third-party tools that we can use to help uh, do some additional checks against our code base. There's a tool called tflint. Uh, there's also uh, some scanning tools called Chekhov or TF Security or TerraScan, which are focused on sort of the security aspects of your Terraform config. And then the uh, cloud, the managed cloud offering offers a tool called Terraform Sentinel, which is enterprise only. So you have to have the, the highest paid tier uh, to use it, but it can help you to validate some uh, security configurations and enforce some rules on your uh, code base uh, that, that you can get if you want to use that, which would be great from a, a security and compliance perspective. Uh, if you need that sort of level of guarantees about the configurations that you're you're managing. You can always, as you might expect, do manual testing of things. Uh, this would just be following that similar life cycle of commands that we talked about many times throughout the course, where you're running an init, you're running an apply, a plan, apply, and destroy. Uh, so this can give you a sense of, hey, does this configuration actually produce a working uh, set of infrastructure? And that's great, but we would much prefer for this type of thing to be automated. So we can take that type of manual testing and we can just automate all those steps uh, with a shell script or whatever other technique we'd want. And so for example, we could take our uh, example, uh, run this script in CI where we're starting off, we're, we're going into the directory, we're initializing, we're applying it, we're waiting some amount of time, and then we are issuing a curl request against our uh, IP address. So we've, we've gotten our IP out as a, an output there on line 17, issue a API request against our endpoint. Uh, and if we get back what we want, that means that we have provisioned our, our server and it is running. Uh, and if it succeeds, then we could go ahead and destroy those. So this is a way, it's kind of a hacky way, but just kind of a, a, the most bare bones example of how you could automate that manual testing cycle and turn it into a simple automated test. We probably don't want to just have a hacky shell script as our uh, end all be all. And so there are tools that allow us to define tests uh, within actual programming languages to test our infrastructure and make more complex assertions about what we expect to happen. So I've taken that same test that we had before and now implemented it in Go using a tool called TerraTest. Uh, and so we import this testing package. Uh, we go through, and it this is essentially the same as that shell script. We uh, initialize our configuration. We apply it. It allows us to specify, oh, we're going to try 30 times. If we fail, we will give a five-second wait, and then we'll try until we get a success. Or if we don't get a success, uh, we'll fail the test. Uh, and we use that defer Terraform destroy so that at the end of the test, regardless of whether we succeeded or failed, we will hit uh, hit that destroy command and that will allow us to clean up the infrastructure and avoid any uh, resources that will remain and, and cause us to, to have additional charges because of that. So this is just showcasing how we can use actual programming languages like Go to test our infrastructure's code configurations, which is a very powerful thing. Uh, I wanna cover a few things within the demo portion of this section. First, I'll just show kind of the repo layout here for how I would suggest laying out your repo. I have four directories at the top level uh, one for modules. So this is where we would actually define uh, any of the modules that we are building. Uh, in this case, I have a hello world module that I'll be showcasing. It's a little simpler than our web app that we've been using, and I'll just be using it as a way for us to test, uh, to show how to use some of these different testing techniques. Uh, so within this module, it is just a AWS instance with our standard web server uh, within the user data block, uh, as well as a security group that will allow inbound traffic uh, on port 8080. So that is the module that we will be testing. Uh, within uh, the examples directory is where I would suggest having a working example of consuming that module so that anyone coming into this repo can see, oh, here are the different uh, variables that I need to set and how I would actually use this. So this looks similar to before. We've got our, our backend and our providers defined. Uh, we are then referencing our module since it's in the same file system with this relative path. 
we're going to consume two outputs from that module. We're going to take the IP address uh, of the instance, and then we're actually going to use that IP address to build a URL that we're going to hit to test that it did indeed come online and is serving that web server. And we've got the network configuration set up. Within the deployed directory is where you would actually put your different environments. So if you had a production environment and staging environment, like we showed in the last portion of the course, uh, this is where you would actually deploy those things. I don't have anything defined in here. These are just empty files as a placeholder, but those are kind of the three uh, directories that we've seen so far. And then the fourth one here is this test directory. And so I'm gonna show a few different types of testing. Uh, the first of which is just sort of static checks. So these are not quite tests, but they're still useful to perform. Uh, analysis against the code base. So if we open the preview here, there's a few different things we can do. One, we can use the Terraform format command and there's kind of an opinionated formatting structure built into the Terraform binary that allows us to see if it is formatted as we would want. So if we wanted to actually do that, we can go into, let's say, our modules directory into hello world and do Terraform format. Looks like it didn't actually perform anything or I can do Terraform format check and it didn't output anything. If I were to go and change something about that module, so let's say I had my formatting a little off. Uh, actually, it auto corrects. So let me save without formatting. And so now it is still correct syntactically, uh, but it has this ugly uh, indentation. If I do a Terraform format check, it will tell me, oh, instance.tf is incorrect and should be changed. If I do Terraform format, it will go off and make that change on my behalf. So this can be a good check to run within your continuous integration to make sure that uh, everyone on your team is following the, the style guide that is provided from Terraform in terms of formatting your code. We also can issue things like the Terraform validate, uh, which will check if it is a valid config. Terraform plan, as we've seen, gives us a, a listing of what changes would be made if we want to apply. Uh, we talked a little bit about custom validation rules in the language features portion, but here's an example of what you could do. You, if you had a variable that you wanted to make sure was very short, in the variable block, you can include certain conditions. And so then when you do your Terraform plan command, it will actually evaluate the variable that you're inputting. And if it is too long, it would give this value. So another example of how you might use this is for a password, you might enforce that it has to be of at least a certain length. There's also a number of third-party tools uh, that you can use to help scan your Terraform configurations from a correctness, security, and compliance perspective. So definitely look into some of those tools. Now, I talked about how you can automate some of the process that you would normally use uh, with a bash script. And so that is what this test would look like. Um, here, we're just going to navigate to the examples directory, initialize and apply. And this auto approve is how you avoid having that prompt asking if you do indeed want to apply. And then while that instance starts up, I want to wait at least a minute for that to happen because uh, that's how long it would take. This is a little bit hacky and we would actually want to use a provisioner within our Terraform config could make this more robust so that we're not just sleeping in arbitrary length, but actually waiting on that uh, instance to come up. And then I'm going to take the output from my module where I'm actually getting uh, the IP address and issue a curl request to that IP and make sure that it returns a successful a success a successful HTTP code uh, when making that request. Finally, if it succeeds, I destroy the resources so I end up paying for those test resources. So let's go ahead and run that. So if, with, if I'm within my test bash directory, I'll do hello world test. And it's gonna go through these steps, initialize that virtual machine, test that it came online and I can get a successful response back on port 8080 and then destroy it on my behalf. Okay, our Terraform apply step here on line nine has completed. Uh, we got back our instance IP as well as this URL. It's now sleeping for a minute simply because that web server is not started up immediately and we wanna give a little bit of time for that to be live. Uh, so it's still not online yet. And it looks like on the right-hand side, that watch command was issuing it every, every couple of seconds. 
it is now successfully returning. So when we make that request on the left, there we got it. And because it was a successful request, that's going to go ahead and proceed. If that request had failed, the bash script would have exited with a code other than zero, indicating that it was a failed test. And so if we were running that within a CI system, that would indicate a failed CI pipeline, and we would get a notification accordingly. Now, while that's running, I can start to describe an improved approach. While it's fine to use a bash script like that, uh, there are tools that allow us to use real coding languages, such as Go, to define our tests. So here within the TerraTest folder, I've defined an equivalent test using the TerraTest package from Gruntwork uh, to define exactly the same thing, uh, except it's a lot more robust. So we're no longer we're just sleeping for 30 seconds and, west and resting. Uh, here, we can actually specify how many times we want to retry, how long we want to wait between retries, etc. And so now that that bash test is complete, I'll do go mod download to make sure I have all the dependencies that we are using here. That'll go off and fetch all of those. Uh, and now I can do go test dash V. I'll set the timeout to 10 minutes. And that is going to run our test script. So it's going to find all of the tests within that directory and is using that Terra test package to provision our system. Again, we're essentially doing a Terraform apply on that example behind the scenes. Then once it has come online, we will issue a number of requests looking for the output from that uh, on the URL. And that once it returns successful, will cause the test to succeed. If we don't get any successful responses from that server, uh, then we would give up eventually and fail the test. And so by using TerraTest, we have many more powerful uh, primitives for defining the nuanced types of tests that we might want to perform for our infrastructure. And it allows us to take advantage of all of the normal Golang tooling for actually testing our code. We can see now it's making those attempted requests they're, the server is not online yet, and it's not accessible, so we're failing. But we set the retry high enough in order to get a successful request and then pass the test. Here it looks like we got out our hello world log. And so at that point, we got our 200 response status in that request. And we went off and destroyed uh, the infrastructure behind the scenes. Now, another powerful test that I like to add to any Terraform project is to periodically execute a Terraform plan command within your CI CD system. And what that's going to do is if there have been any changes, uh, either via the CLI or via the UI, outside of what Terraform knows about, you can set it up so that it will fail the test. And that will notify you so that you can go check, hey, what's different about my deployed infrastructure from my infrastructure's code configuration? And if it was by accident, I want to revert those changes. If it was on purpose, I want to bring those changes back into the configuration. OK, our test is completed. We've destroyed that infrastructure. And hopefully that gives you an idea of how to start using testing principles along with your infrastructure as code configurations to make your infrastructure deployments much more reliable. Now, at this point, we understand how Terraform works, how to use the HashiCorp configuration language, how we should be organizing and structuring our code with these modules how to manage multiple environments, how to test our code. And now this final portion, I want to kind of bring it all together and help you to understand what different workflows would look like, both from a developer perspective, as well as from automating the operations of using a tool like Terraform uh, to ensure that we have reliable infrastructure and can update it uh, accordingly. The general workflow uh, that a developer who is using Terraform is going to go through is you write and update that code. Uh, you run those changes locally. Maybe you have a development environment that you can uh, change without having any issues. Uh, once you're satisfied that your config matches what you want it to, you would then create a pull request. Uh, so because we're storing all of our configurations in a version control system, like GitHub, for example, we can create this pull request so that one of your colleagues can review those changes, issue comments, maybe make suggestions for improvements. That we would want to kick off a test run from within our continuous integration system. So if we're using GitHub as our example, that might be GitHub Actions. So that could run maybe that Terra test that we had that I had shown before. 
uh, spin up a copy of the infrastructure, make sure things are still working as they are expected to. Uh, if they are, give us a green check mark and tear that infrastructure down. And that gives us confidence that when we do end up uh, deploying this to production, uh, we're not going to run into any issues. If we merge that pull request to the main branch, we could have an automated pipeline within GitHub Actions again, uh, or whatever continuous integration, continuous delivery pipelining tool of choice, and deploy those changes to staging automatically. So rather than have a developer uh, issue a, a Terraform apply command locally on their laptop, we want those things to be automated so that we can avoid the potential for human error. And so we deploy those changes to staging. And then maybe on the next release, so let's say we tag a release within uh, GitHub, that could kick off a, a separate pipeline, which now takes those same changes that were, were made on main and deploys them to our production branch. So this is kind of the general workflow that I would recommend. I would also recommend having a testing schedule on a cron, on a cron stream. So periodically running just a Terraform plan from within your continuous integration tool. And if that plan shows any changes from the deployed state to the current, uh, the, the current config on your main branch, to raise an error. And so that can be an easy check to see if something was changed out of band and, and find that very quickly and, and make sure that that gets uh, reverted or at least integrated back into the config if it was uh, a purposeful change. So that's what the general workflow looks like. There's also an important consideration here of working with multiple accounts within AWS or the, the terminology is different from cloud to cloud. In GCP, they're called projects. Uh, in AWS, they're called accounts. Oftentimes, it is beneficial from a security perspective to have one account for staging, one account for production, one account for development, etc. Having these resources deployed into different accounts makes it much easier to manage the level of granularity for uh, access that you need to within IAM policies to enforce the controls for the different environments, both from the infrastructure that's deployed as well as for these Terraform backends. We want to isolate the environments to protect against potential issues. So if you make a mistake and you blow up the development environment, that doesn't impact staging and production. So if we can isolate at the account level, it makes it uh, much stronger guarantees that making a mistake in one will not make a mistake in the other. It also helps us to avoid naming conflicts with things. So if we're deploying everything into one account, you oftentimes cannot have the same name for uh, an individual resource within that account. Uh, and so you end up having to add all these prefixes or postfixes. So maybe you say database-production, database-staging. Those changes now need to be templated across any place that's used, and that can just be annoying to deal with. If you're working with a multi-account setup, you can just name the database whatever the application name is, and that can be identical across those different accounts. And that allows it to... You, it allows you to avoid having to template that in, in as many places, which can be nice. It does add some complexity to your Terraform config, but in general, I think it's still worth it to think about multi-account uh, or multi-project setups uh, wherever possible. And as you need to start uh, tightening up your security, this is going to be an important way to, to go about doing that. There's a great talk on the HashiCorp website uh, from... Cobus Bernard about how to use multiple accounts with AWS and Terraform. And so I would suggest using that if you want to do a deep dive on how this would look and, and how you can go about implementing this within your own project. I just wanted to call it out here uh, as something that you, you likely want to think about as you move forward and, and continue to grow with, with Terraform. I also want to call out a couple of third-party tools uh, that are from a company called Gruntwork that make working with Terraform much nicer. Uh, I talked about Terragrunt a little bit in a previous section, but it is a tool that helps you minimize the repetition of code throughout your code base. It also helps with what I was just talking about in terms of dealing with multiple accounts and reducing the tedium of switching uh, between AWS credentials, et cetera. And so it can, it can make a lot of that smoother. There's also a tool called Cloud Nuke, uh, and it essentially allows you to very easily clean up a bunch of resources. So one worry that a lot of people have with working in the cloud is that you can spin up resources and then forget to tear them down and then get hit with a big nasty bill the next month when uh, you get that billing email and it's thousands of dollars. Uh, 
And so one method to avoid that is, uh, let's say you isolate all of your testing to a specific AWS account where you don't have anything else except for testing of Terraform. You could then use this Cloud Nuke tool to very easily clean up everything within it. Uh, and it can go through and, and wipe out all the resources. Uh, and so this can be a, a sort of a backstop if people are forgetting to tear down their test configs that they, they provisioned man that they provisioned manually, you could have this periodically go clean those up. Um, I'm also a big fan of just local bash scripts and make files to store off commands that you uh, need to craft that have lots of options and arguments. Uh, and so putting them into a, a repeatable, scriptable fashion uh, just helps to prevent human error in issuing those commands. Um, so using make files or, or shell scripts uh, can help to, to avoid human error in those situations. Now, I mentioned earlier uh, GitHub Actions as kind of the example, but there's many different CI CD tools that can be used, uh, including CircleCI, GitLab, uh, Atlantis uh, is kind of a Terraform specific one. Uh, but these are all great, and you should take a look at if your organization is using one of them, how you can use that for uh, for integrating your infrastructure as code deployment and testing as well. Now, I want to call out some potential gotchas with Terraform that can lead you to have a bad day. Uh, <laughs> and these are sometimes non-intuitive. So the first one is if you change the name of a resource within your Terraform config, uh, it can lead Terraform to think, oh, they want to delete this resource and create a new one. Uh, and so sometimes that might be what you want, but sometimes it might not be. And so you want to be careful when changing names, even if it seems like, oh, I'm just improving the how descriptive this variable name is. Uh, I want to warn you to, about that. So you could end up deleting an old resource and create a new one. So make sure you think about that. I talked about this early on, but your Terraform state files do have sensitive data within them. Uh, so be careful in, in making sure to encrypt and manage permissions accordingly. Cloud timeouts. Uh, so by this, I mean, you can issue a command and sometimes that command will take a long time for uh, the server to provision or for the database to be provisioned, et cetera. And so if there are things that take a long time behind the scenes, Terraform sometimes has timeouts where it will provision half your infrastructure and then the other thing was taking too long and it gives up. And so you can configure those timeouts accordingly, but it's just something to think about. And usually if you just reissue the Terraform apply command, it will uh, fix that, but they can be they can be a little challenging. Uh, naming conflicts. So if you're provisioning two things, two resources within the same AWS account, oftentimes they can, uh, if they have the same name, the second one will fail to create. And so you need to think about that as you're provisioning your resources and make sure that they are uh, named accordingly. Another one is forgetting to destroy your test infrastructures. I talked about that cloud nuke tool as a potential solution for this, but if you provision stuff and then never run the destroy command, it is just running there and, and costing you money. So making sure to always run that Terraform destroy command uh, or clean up somehow periodically is important to avoid surprise bills. Terraform also has unidirectional version upgrades. And by that, I mean, if I run Terraform version 1.0.0 to provision my infrastructure, and then my colleague runs Terraform 1.1.0, I can now no longer issue a command with my older version of Terraform uh, because the state file is associated with the version of the, uh, of the Terraform binary that was used with it. So I would then need to upgrade and so if you have a large team, you want to make sure everyone is using the same version of Terraform on their local system, as well as matching that version in your CI CD system. There's also just many ways to accomplish the same configuration. Um, so that's not necessarily a, a con, but it's just as you're thinking about things, there's always multiple ways to do it. And so thinking through, hey, what would be the cleanest representation of this infrastructure is important to think about. There's also some parameters within a given resource that are immutable. Uh, and by that, I mean, by that, I mean, if I provision some specific resource, there are certain fields within that resource that I could change and there are certain fields that I cannot. And so uh, if there, if I need to make a change associated with one of those uh, immutable parameters, I will need to delete the previous resource and provision a new one. And so that's another consideration in terms of thinking about downtime. And then the final one is something that's come up a few times I've mentioned, 
is making changes out of the normal Terraform uh, sequence of events. Uh, and that is something that you just want to avoid uh, whenever possible. Your team needs to be bought into using Terraform as the only means of, of deploying this infrastructure and you can reap the benefits. But if you are partially bought in and deploying infrastructure with Terraform, but then making changes, now your Terraform config is no longer accurate and it's actually dangerous because if you apply it, it will revert any change you had made out of band. So these are just a few gotchas. I think in general, if you understand these and are thoughtful about how to approach your uh, configuration, you will reap many benefits by using Terraform or another infrastructure as code tool. Uh, but you want to think about these and, and avoid uh, making changes in these ways uh, as you go out and, and build your infrastructure. For this final demo portion of the course, I'm going to walk through how I've implemented that described workflow uh, with all the automation within GitHub Actions uh, and how that would work for the various different elements of that. Uh, I've got pulled up here the GitHub workflow YAML file uh, with three different triggers for when this workflow is going to run. Uh, the first of which is if we push to the main branch, that's going to go through and actually deploy our staging environment. Uh, if we issue a release, so if we tag a new release with a Semver version, that will uh, trigger the, the workflow as well. And then finally, on any pull request uh, is when we're going to want to go through and run our Terra test testing script to validate that the configuration is working as expected. Uh, I've gone ahead and pre-populated these GitHub secrets uh, within the UI uh, containing the values that Terraform is going to need to access uh, AWS, as well as populated a database password that's going to get populated in when we issue our Terraform apply as well. I'm just setting our working directory to be in the proper location for issuing our Terraform commands. Uh, this is a, a step that is in almost every GitHub action where you're checking out the code base. Uh, I'm then using a public GitHub action step from HashiCorp uh, that will set up uh, Terraform within the repo and use a specific version. I'm going to run one of those static checks just to make sure that everything is formatted correctly. So I have the Terraform format check command there. If something is not formatted correctly, it will throw an error there and stop. We then want to initialize as always. If this is a pull request, we're going to issue a Terraform plan command. Uh, and that is just a good check to see if the plan succeeds. So would we be able to make an apply? However, if it doesn't succeed, I'm allowing it to continue anyways. Now, the reason I want it to continue is that I'm using the following step within the workflow to pull the results of, those, of that Terraform plan and display it within the action interface. Uh, so that we'll be able to see the exact changes that would be applied uh, from the UI. After we've done that, if we have a plan outcome as a failure, then we want to fail the workflow. So we're allowing it to proceed if it's failed at first, but then showing it within the UI before we fail later. That just makes it much more convenient to go see what happened. I'm then setting up Go so that I'll be able to execute Terra test for any pull request. We're then going to run the test just like we did in the last portion of the course. Next up, I want to validate whether or not the tag that triggered the workflow matches a Semver version or not. Uh, so in this case, if my reference is it V followed by a number dot another number dot another number, and if it matches, we'll set our production environment. If instead we're on the main branch, then we'll set our staging environment. Otherwise, we'll set it to unknown. In this step, we actually go ahead and make those Terraform apply changes. Uh, in this step, we apply the global portion of our config. So that's that DNS zone, whether we're on the main branch or if it was a release. Then we can go apply our staging if above, our validation check told us we were in staging. Otherwise, we'll apply production. Because the production config lives in a different directory, I'm also setting the working directory here. And so this is all the config that's required to set up that fully automated workflow. Let me commit something and push it to the main branch so that we can apply both our global and our staging environment from GitHub Actions.
So now within our repository, if we go up here to the Actions tab, we should see a new workflow kicked off because I pushed to the main branch. Let's follow along as that progresses. We have our main Terraform job here with all of these steps that I just walked through. We successfully installed Terraform. We ran Terraform format. We initialized. Because this was not a pull request, we skipped the Terraform plan steps. We're setting up Go. We skipped the Terra test execution. We're checking our tag. In this case, we evaluated this, and it should have output staging because we're on the main branch. We're now applying our global configuration to create that zone. Our DNS zone was created successfully. We can move on to the apply staging stage. Also, moving the execution of these steps, since they take quite a long time, from your local system onto a remote system like GitHub Actions, means that you can make these changes to your repo, go off and work on other stuff, and then come back and check on the results rather than needing to sit here and babysit and make sure that your terminal is executing as expected and worry about your computer going to sleep, etc. Now, while this is running, I'm actually gonna go issue a release uh, within the GitHub repo, which should trigger another workflow that's gonna do the production apply. So I'll go back here to the repo. Over here on releases, draft new release. Uh, so I'm gonna issue a new release. Uh, I'm gonna call it v.1.0.0. Initial course release. And then we can Choose a tag, create new tag on publish. Looks great, publish. Now within our actions tab, this one is still going. It's deploying our staging environment. Should be almost done, but we got a new workflow corresponding to that release tag. And it should look very similar, uh, except now within our check tag, we're gonna get production, and then instead of applying staging, we'll skip that step and apply production. Yep, we skip staging, and now it's gonna go off and start provisioning our production environment. Now, the one other piece that I described is the testing that happens when you make a pull request. So let's go ahead and uh, create a branch that we can create a pull request from. Uh, so I'll do git checkout dash b show testing on pr. Uh, that gives us a new branch. Uh, now I'll just make an empty commit. So I'll do git commit allow empty dash m show testing on prs. Git push. So I'll push that to GitHub. And now from within the GitHub interface, if we go up here, it looks like our deployment to staging has succeeded. Our deployment per to production is happening as we speak. Uh, and we can go to actions and we need to issue a pull request on that new branch. So we'll go from testing to main, looks good. Create pull request. And that should kick off the third type of workflow, which is going to be that testing sequence. And we can see on the pull request, it shows us this workflow is in progress. And if we wanna see the details, it'll take us into that job. Here, because it's a pull request, we are gonna issue those plan commands. Then we're gonna issue that GitHub script that's going to push the push that information back to our pull request in the UI. Uh, it shows us that Terraform format and style was a success, Terraform initialization was a success, and Terraform plan was a success. Uh, if we wanted to see the results of that plan, we can go into the details here uh, under the plan step and see 
the different resources that it was going to provision. Also, because this is a pull request, we're executing those that Terra test test. It looks like our example has provisioned. It is now uh, issuing those get requests to our web server and seeing if they succeed. Assuming that completes, our check tag step will not show production or staging, so it should skip uh, all of the remaining steps and finish here shortly. Okay, our Terra test execution completed successfully. Uh, our web app came up. Uh, we were able to hit it with a HTTP request and then it was destroyed. So that's great. Uh, we got to our check tag step. It did not see staging or environment conditions. And so we skipped all of the Terraform applies uh, and then we finished our job. So for one last time, let's go confirm that our web app was indeed deployed to DevOps Deployed as well as staging.devopsdeployed.com. Okay, DevOps Deployed is working and staging.devops. And now I don't have any automation set up to destroy this infrastructure, so I'm gonna go uh, destroy it manually. I'll do the same for the staging and the global environments once this completes. Also, to avoid any small changes to the repo from causing that to be deployed over and over, since I don't want to actually keep this infrastructure running, uh, I'm going to go ahead and within the workflow, comment out the trigger on the main branch, and then put a comment saying, uh, uncomment this portion to enable staging deploy from main. Go ahead and push that. Okay, now that I have turned that off, we should not get an additional action workflow uh, based on that push. And our code should reflect the latest. Great, so if we did wanna have the setup again, uncomment that, and that will allow us to have that staging environment deployed from the main branch. Uh, but for now, in case I need to make any updates, the documentation, uh, and I don't want this this infrastructure to stay up on my AWS account forever, that's what I'm gonna leave the state of the code. And so there we have it, a fully automated infrastructure as code solution with multiple environments using GitHub Actions to actually do the deployments as well as to manage, as well as execute some code quality checks uh, and tests on our infrastructure as code configurations. And with that, we've reached the end of the course. Congratulations. If you've been following along, you should now be ready to go off and use Terraform to encode your cloud infrastructure within your code base and help ensure reliable operations for you and your team. If you got value from the course, go ahead and hit the like button to let YouTube know. And if you want to check out how Terraform can be used with another cloud provider and a different application, go watch this other video that I created in partnership with Linode. That's it for today, and remember, just keep building. Mm -hmm.